Hey, what is going on, guys? Hope you're having a fantastic Sunday night. Welcome to the AV Experience. So tonight, we got a fun topic for you. We're going to be talking about, is reference volume, like, is that important in home theater? So it's going to be a fun conversation. So be thinking of what you would answer and how you would answer that. And we'll get some thoughts in the chat. And so happy new year again to everybody. We're, uh, what, week two of the new year, technically. I guess if you yeah. start on Sunday, this would be week two. Yes. Yeah. So right still early. So hopefully your new year's kicking off good. If you made some new year's resolutions, hopefully you haven't broken those already and uh, you're off to a good start. So each episode, we're going to try to get back to having a topic at the beginning and then we'll address that topic, have some good conversation, get some comments from you guys. But then after that, we will, uh, take your questions. And so if you've got home theater questions, drop those in the chat and we'll get to those in the order that they were created and super chats get bumped up to the top of the list. And, uh, so man, I'm super pumped about this topic. And the cool thing is we don't rehearse this. We don't, um, I'm too lazy to rehearse, collaborate and figure out, okay, what are you going to say? Cause I want to make sure that my thoughts line up with your thoughts. You're getting our honest thoughts on this and what's going to be fun about this is there are going to be times that where we do not agree and one thing i hope that uh the av experience um kind of models is it's okay to disagree it's okay to have differences of opinion it's okay for jonathan and ryan to be wrong and me to be right um that's okay but there are going to be times where we just don't agree but you can see that doesn't change our friendship. It doesn't change our camaraderie. It doesn't change the way that we think about each other. We I mean, secretly it does. I just don't tell you. <laughs> Maybe it does <laughs> as secretly. But we want to, like I said, we want to model that. Uh, I think this niche of home theater, I think that, that we should be able to have differences of opinion, whether it's on cables, whether it's on the DAX make a difference, whatever the topic. And we can, at the end of the day, have difference of opinions, but still, you know, shake hands and be friends about it. So Jonathan's laughing. Like, I'm laughing at little comments that pop in here like this. Like <laughs> you can have an opinion, but it's going to be wrong. See, exactly. That's yeah, right. I agree with Chris. No, uh, you're just wrong. So My yeah, daughter so made me watch Godzilla today <laughs> with her. Was it a new one? Out. No, she watches all of them. <sighs> and I'm all for it. I'll rewatch them as many times as wait. Needed. Isn't your daughter like four years old? She's five. <laughs> Too Godzilla's one of her favorite movies. Heck yeah, man. Why wouldn't she, he? Godzilla always comes on screen. She's like, Dad, look. And he's just I, beating the crap out of some monster. And it's she's all excited about it. I think I rest my case. That's all that needs to be said right there. No, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. That's so bad. You got to go in with the expectation of what Godzilla is going to be, and then you just let it roll. All and right. Be happy all about right. it. It's funny. Jonathan's <laughs> over here wanting to be stimulated all the time. It's like I, I need mathematics and all of this <laughs> genius material. And no, Godzilla sometimes perfectly adequate, and I am oh, yeah. very happy with it. Jonathan <laughs> just thinks he's better than all of us. No, I never, never. I just can't do Godzilla. He does. <laughs> Secretly, when nobody's watching on his phone, he's watching it. He's whispering <clears throat> into it. I'm the best. <laughs> a cool deal. So, one thing that has happened this week, thanks to Ryan, is we are now on Spotify and we're also on Apple. And so, there'll be two episodes. We started just the new year adding those to um, those platforms, but technically, we're going to be on like episode two years in, three years in. Um, episode a sense. lot. Yeah. So I'll go back and I'll figure out how many episodes we've had of the AV experience and we'll label those accordingly and we'll kind of start um, with that. And so, but yeah, so oh, we're, that have what we're doing. Did we decide that? That we're doing that? I'm doing it, man. Okay. I'm making an executive decision. I, I did tell Michael that he needs to decide within yeah. the first 30 seconds and he did. He yeah. made a decision. Well, the reality is it doesn't make sense. It's kind of like having, I was telling these guys, it's like having a check, a new checking account. And starting off with zero 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 or zero 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 one, it's like maybe you've had a checking account for several years. It just seems kind of weird. 
So we're not on episode two. We just have two episodes on Spotify and two episodes on Apple. Uh, so I'm excited about that. So a lot of you guys have been asking over the years, hey, are you planning on putting that on, uh, you know, because you travel. Maybe you're a truck driver. Maybe you just drive long hours to work and you've got plenty of time to kill. And that's a good way for you to pass the time is listening to the podcast. So we do have that available. So we're excited about that. So with that said, hold on before we get into that. Yeah. Jonathan. Oh, is it a new oh. color for the new year? No, I really? just play with the, I just play with the little <laughs> no, things. They're the almost little always toys. red and now they're That's not. True. I usually like red speakers the best. Yes. More than green, but yeah, he's over here. Oh, I always play with them and they're always red. If you and guys, that's crazy. Time. I've changed the color on this thing. Like every single podcast for the first, like 30 podcasts. If you guys didn't notice that I got nothing. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is know. why my wife's like, you don't pay attention. Maybe that's why I get that all the time. It's probably why. Yeah. I like the I like the blues and greens myself, but that's just me. I'm a blue and green kind of guy. So I mean, wearing a green shirt. But blue mm -hmm. and green gets in the way of your AV experience. It's got to be red. It's easiest mm -hmm. on the eyes. I don't know. Red red just means you're angry. Like well, it red doesn't perfectly with me. Mind. Everybody like, thinks I'm angry anyway, so it just I works. I know. It. I love the new mood lights. Too funny. All right. Well, let's jump on into tonight's topic. Is reference volume important for home theater? And there's probably two, not thoughts, but two angles for this. And again, we don't pre-rehearse this. We don't discuss it. We don't do clip notes or bullet points. It's just, it is what it is. But I think there's two sides of this. There's reference volume, like when you're listening and consuming content. And then there's also calibrating for reference. Am I correct? correct. Those can be not yep. one and the same. Correct. Okay. So I think the direction you're wanting to talk about mainly is the volume at which we listen to movies. Is that correct? Mm, or no. Okay. I don't think most people listen at reference volume. I correct. We don't really listen necessarily at reference volume either. <laughs> Demo okay. Demoing. Demoing, okay. yes. But yeah. in our normal, where do you guys normally listen? Minus 10? Minus I'm 6, minus 8. I'm at negative 10. Most of the time when I'm watching movies, it's negative 10. Sometimes it's negative 15. Um, I think when we watched Top Gun Maverick, it was either negative five. It could have been at reference for that. Because I just, I leaned over to my wife and I'm like, babe, this is just one of the movies. You just got to crank it up at least a little bit. And she was cool with that. So we turned it up a little bit for that one. But typically I'm about negative 10 on, on average. I think I'm right with eight. Jonathan. I'm like negative five to eight somewhere in there depending on what it is sometimes lower sometimes higher and i'm seeing this a lot in the questions that i'm seeing come by that you know people are saying that things are too loud mm -hmm. things are too soft and somebody was saying that negative 10 on movies and the negative 20 and 25 mm -hmm. on cable and i think that's important to bring up that not everything is mastered the same so mm -hmm. you need to make sure and understand that you're not going to listen at the same volume, like your same volume. Your AVR is not going to say minus 10 or minus five, and it's going to be the same all the time. It depends on how the content was mastered, which is going to dictate how loud it is at X, mm -hmm. whatever you're putting into it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important for people to understand um, because you're going to deviate. It's going to change, especially with music. It goes up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I've definitely seen a lot of more with music. Sure. So seen are you saying that. that the different sources? So let's say you have an Apple TV, you have a 4K player, you have maybe a Roku, um, YouTube. Oh, it's, it's further than that. It's content. Okay. So you're saying the so you could be listening to the same source, but putting one 4K player, 4K movie, and technically it'd be at this volume, mm -hmm. but then you put in another one, it could be louder or softer. Mm -hmm. certainly studio to studio can have different Absolutely. volumes different mastering everybody's volumes. going to have their own point at which or every studio and mastering studio is going to have their own point at which they master content and mm -hmm. it, even that may vary so I think that's important to to keep in mind yeah Jonathan even says physical versus streaming will affect SPL as well mm -hmm. so this one's always interesting so uh, and I hear a lot of this with the Anthem products um I think there was somebody else up here. 
Yeah. So Anthem, it didn't really say that. Um, but I've heard that Anthem calibrates a little bit differently with ARC than say Odyssey or AccuEQ or uh, YPAL. And it seems like it calibrates a lot lower in volume. So where I would normally listen to at a certain volume, there's maybe different, maybe loud. I don't remember if it's louder or softer. So Nicholas says negative 20 with his AVM 90 is actually really loud. But loud is also subjective. Like what do you, Rude. what is loud? What are you <laughs> defining as loud? Like true. You, I got you. It's like, if I ask somebody, <laughs> what's your budget? And they say, oh, affordable. Well, what's affordable, right? That differs with every person. And loud mm -hmm. is the same way. Loud is subjective true. to the individual. So That's I encourage true. people to, if you haven't already, get an SPL meter. They're not mm -hmm. expensive. Yeah. Pick one up and see what the average is that you're actually listening at. Mm -hmm. Put some test tones on, different types of test tones, and see what they are see if everything's level matched i mean there's mm -hmm. a lot of information that you can gain from just taking the spl mm -hmm. that is coming from your speakers it's going to give you a lot of information about your system and your listening habits mm -hmm. so jonathan what are your thoughts yeah i there's a couple things that i would say i don't think that there's a right or wrong first off as far as what your preference is but there is a right or wrong as far as your setup Mm -hmm. The reason that reference is developed is so that we all have a standardized listening volume and we can talk to each other and know what the other person's listening to. So if Michael says, I like negative eight, then I more or less know what negative eight is, right? Mm -hmm. Because if I just yeah. let the receiver do it and I walk away or I don't even do any calibration. I do negative eight could be 20, 30 dB apart. Mm -hmm. If we all set up our system with the, with the test tones from the AVR, from a, you know, a disc like the Apple disc or the, Spears and Munsell or the Disney Wow disc, and we all set it up that we know we, we're speaking the same language. Yeah. We all know what negative eight is or what negative 12 is, and we have a common bearing. Um, so even if you don't listen at reference, I think it's important to do that. Mm -hmm. I have a little sound meter here I'd like to show you. Yeah, um, let me put it up here. Basically, what you'll do for, and it may not even show up very well. I got well, the same one, the top tees. Yeah. They're yeah. like 25 bucks on Amazon sure. or something. Um, if you don't have a calibrated mic, you take one of these and you use your internal receiver test tones is the simplest way to do it. Uh, Denon, Marantz, some of the different products, they'll use a 30 dB offset. So you'll set your main listening volume to zero. That's important. Your main volume knob goes to zero and then you use the test tones and you hold this about where your ears would be at head height in the main listening position and you cycle through all your speakers and if it's got a 30 dB offset test tone, you're going to set it to 75 dB with the internal receiver test tone. If it has a 20 dB offset tone, like some of the boutique products, uh, Storm, Trend Off, stuff like that, it would be, if it has internal test tones, it would be a 20 dB offset. So you'd set it to 85 mm -hmm. with your with your SPL meter. Once you've done that, then you then we all speak in the same language. We know that we're talking what we're you know we're all talking apples to apples when we're talking sound mm -hmm. levels so that's that's important the other thing that's kind of nice about references they've done the studies it's been around since the 1970s we know that it's not going to hurt your hearing like that's kind of this the maximum safe volume that's been agreed upon by the powers that be that says this won't hurt your hearing it, it you may think it sounds loud it may hurt your hearing subjectively individually because you're not used to something loud but it won't supposedly physically damage your hearing Mm -hmm. So it's a good safe spot. I limit my AVR to zero in the in the menu options because I don't right. want it to go louder than that. Sometimes during these fun little celebration things, we're having you demos over, it over. Sounds yeah. so good, you just keep cranking it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my experience, you can listen to reference for hours, and your ears don't really ring the next day with a with a well capable system. As soon as you start ticking past that, even just like three or four dB past that my ears are ringing. So to me, it, it holds true that that seems a pretty safe volume. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a, not only a good apples to apples, just a level playing field, make sure everyone's talking the same language, but also like a safety benchmark that we can say, we're going to, we're going to play within the realm of reason and, and know where we are as far as our safety and our, our, and our hearings uh, longevity. Yeah. So that's my, that's my take. Yeah, on and it. some people had mentioned, you know, we definitely need to make sure that we're taking care of our hearing. And um, so like I said, to me, reference volume is a bit louder than I like to listen to a full movie. Now I'll do demos at reference, no problem. 
Um, cause you're talking, you know, two, three minutes, but for me to watch a two hour movie now, granted everything during a movie, isn't full wide open, you know, 105 DB all the time, but it can get that loud. And so to me, that's a little bit loud for my taste. And I think Jonathan's right. That's where preference comes into play. But mm -hmm. when you calibrate, you still want to calibrate it to reference. And it's, it is interesting because I've been watching the chat and some of you are saying like um, this gentleman here, I think he said it to negative, negative 20 and negative 30, he said is like ear piercing. So if your system is calibrated to reference, that shouldn't be the case. That's correct. Um, uh, that could be something else though. Ear piercing though that could at be negative thirty could be distortion. Yeah, but there's a difference between distortion and ear piercing. Ear piercing is like holy cow, turn it down. Yeah, but your perceived like damaging when you're ear. distorting is going to be much lower than if it's clean, right? You're able to listen to clean volumes much higher. I get that, but I still don't see how negative thirty would it be. It depends on how he's how he's calibrated. calibrated. I don't think so. Yeah, I think you're wrong on that. Absolutely, one. it would depend on how he's calibrated. Let's say yes, of, correct, correct. That's what I mean. Yeah, but if it's not calibrated to reference, that's what it I mean. Can absolutely do that <laughs> for sure. So he's calibrated to reference. He's at negative thirty on the volume, and he's going. Oh my gosh, this is killing my ears. There's no physical. It depends on it, its processor. It, it shouldn't be. If it's calibrated yeah, correctly. Guys, Storm and Chernov do this differently. I Storm, if I'm, I could be a reference at negative 20. I don't calibrate to zero. There's no way to do that. Like that, all the processors so are going I guess you're missing the what we're saying. If you calibrate to zero, there's no physical way that negative 30 on your volume would be ear piercing. That's all I'm saying. You should be able to, and wait, let's no. back up a second. And I don't have a storm or trend off. I've played yeah, with them in my room, but, I, but you know those better than I do because you have had them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you, even if it doesn't have the internal test tones, which maybe I, I thought they did, but if they don't, you could play like an Avala or a Wow or any other process disc that has those 20 and 30 to be offset tones. Mm -hmm. And you make yours, you turn it to zero on your dial. Mm -hmm. And you make yeah, it so you could, but I'm saying that you guys are only considering a very finite amount of variables. And there's a lot of stuff that could be impacting what Tito is talking about. Like you guys are only considering a couple things and you're assuming that this is what's happening. But so what, what could cause that then? I guess I'm saying you don't know what zero is. You don't know where his reference volume is set to. You don't know where reference is in his system. But we know there's a process to get there. We don't know what it is now. If he followed that process. And I think that's what we're saying is if your system is calibrated to reference. No, no, because it depends on what you've set as your zero point. Your <laughs> reference does not have to be zero dB on the meter on your AVR. That doesn't have to be reference. You can set reference to any point. It doesn't matter. And most of the time in Storm, unless you're pushing it all the way, you'll calibrate to like negative 20 or negative 10 or something like that so mm -hmm. you guys are assuming that you're setting reference at zero and Correct. that doesn't have to happen i mean technically it doesn't i mean i could turn my <laughs> when i'm calibrating i could turn my volume down to negative 20 and calibrate that as my 75 db correct if i yes. wanted to but then but to me i'm not means. calibrating to reference i guess is my thought well, you would be, but your main listening volume would be negative 20. So you'd have to do yeah. the little offset. Correct. You would yeah. be. It's just be yeah. represented different. So yeah. my point I mean, with I, this is that you're, you're still that. calibrate. You can still calibrate to that point, but True. you can't assume that what the AVR is telling you is reference or yeah. is a, a value, right? But why, but why would you do that? I don't know. I'm That's simply, a great question. John. I'm simply I'm, saying I'm that you guys are just making the assumption mm -hmm. that everyone is going to do this. And you can't make that assumption. All the consumer uh, AVR should be attempting that. Whether they're that's, successful that's or not, they should be attempting that. Yeah. Storm and Trinov do not do that. I that's don't consider them consumer AVRs. Yeah. That's boutique stuff. You need a per like I was I was talking to Gene Della Sala literally last night, and he's like, This storm thing, this thing is like pretty tough to understand. It's not like yes, but you basics. again, this you're just not... you're making assumptions on what Tito has. You don't even know what he has.
All right, Tito, let us know what you have, brother. So let's, let's end this. That's all let's, I'm saying is there's yeah. a lot of assumptions Tito, being know, made on, and then making a statement based on those assumptions can lead Wait, you down a. Fall I'm gonna path. I'm gonna stop you for a second because there's not yeah. the Michael's right in this particular point. If it's calibrated, if he has negative twenty or negative thirty as reference, like if it's calibrated and that's his offset. Mm -hmm. Then if he's 20 or 30 dB below what true reference is, even if it's negative 20 or negative 30, then he's negative 30 or negative 40 or negative 50. Mm -hmm. And 30, 20 or 30 dB below whatever you categorize reference is but not Tito's too loud. not saying that. He's saying that negative 30 on his AVR. So he has a processor. He has the HTP1 for monolith. So he's calibrating. All, all Tito is saying is that, so everyone's saying that negative 20 and negative 30 is ear piercing are you setting your speaker level to 75? He's asking the question. He's not stating that he's doing anything. Oh, well, if he doesn't do any setup or any, it could be, yeah. No, <clears throat> Tito is asking the chat something. Okay, where's that? Put it up on the screen. He so says, so everyone's saying negative 20 and negative 30 is ear piercing. Are you setting your speaker level to 75 dB? Mm-hmm. He's not doing that. He's asking chat if anybody that is saying negative 20 and negative 30 is ear piercing, have they run calibration? Mm. So again, you guys are making assumptions based on things when the question that's being asked isn't even what you guys are assuming. So maybe I misread the question. Why don't you just say that? <laughs> I, I'm just going I back thought to he was I the way I read that earlier, and I could be wrong. I've been wrong a couple times in my life, even recently. But I read it as when I set mine to negative 20 to negative 30, it's ear piercing. That's, That's the not way how I, I how I read that at all. Okay. Then we read something too <laughs> entirely different. All, all I'm this is I just want to make sure because this yeah, is yeah, I think no, it goes I back it. to what I'm yeah. the video that Gene brought up yeah. earlier is that. A lot, what can get people in trouble is making assumptions based on what's going on. And it's really important that people consider as many variables as possible yeah. before imparting or making any type of a decision based on information in front of them. Otherwise you can lead down, very, you can lead down false paths and you can get to a lot of bad positions where you think you're doing something and you're not. I'm looking back for the original. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't even his. Who was the comment? Help me find the comment, the original comment that said that negative 20 to negative 30 was ear piercing. And so maybe that's where I'm missing it. Because the only one I'm seeing is the one you've got up right now. So he's saying that other people are saying that's ear piercing. So where is that comment? Mm. okay so right here so james mentions negative 30 on his pioneer elite with outlaw audio amp is ear piercing so the question to james would be have you calibrated it to reference to mm. where zero on your avr or processor is reference volume there you and go if so if so negative 30 seems impossible to be ear piercing I guess that was the clear. Maybe I would agree with out. that. Okay. So that, <laughs> all of that to say, that was crazy. Um, I'm sorry if I came across no, like a no, dick. That, no, not at all. I, these are the conversations I think need to be had. You did preface that we're not going to agree. And I'm 100% okay with that. I haven't booted you yet. I, you might not end up next show, but this show <laughs> you're safe. <laughs> you know? I, would, I would agree with that, yeah. that if you calibrate okay. for reference and you okay. go down to negative 30, that you shouldn't be. I guess that was just my question. And so maybe I, I should say asked. that if you calibrate to reference and you go 30 dB under that, Correct. you should not encounter any. Yeah, that, that, that seems like something's just off to me. Like yes. that wouldn't make much sense. So, so okay. look, we're not talking loud. I'm not like being crazy here. I'm just talking normal voice. But this SPL meter is registering me at 72.4 dbc weighted right now just my voice correct. this far away correct that'd be that'd be like 10 db under reference right now right. because reference correct. is supposed to be like a basically normalized a normal talking voice would be like 85 db so if we were watching a movie and i was talking it would be 10 db louder than i'm actually talking right now if you were playing reference now peaks go up to 20 to be higher than that sure but but that 
10 dB louder than what I'm talking at reference. It's not, it's not outrageous. Right. It's not it's just not outrageous. I mean, and if you're talking 20 or 30 dB below that, that's like, that's yeah. like me not talking and you guys talking. <laughs> but wouldn't reference be, I mean, yeah. how much more sound energy is it that, at that point? 10 dB, it's a significant amount of more energy. Yes. I mean, it's perceived as over double. A doubling of, it's a, no, it's a doubling of volume subjectively. So 6 dB to 10 dB yeah. is a subjective range where someone thinks, hey, the volume doubled. Right, correct. So so basically twice as loud as I'm just casually talking to you guys into the mic with the yeah. decibel meter right here is is basically reference. Yeah. Yes, I would agree. I'm just stating that, I mean, people mm -hmm. could, as my wife would assume that, that is very loud. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, Jessica probably would too. She'd be like, all right, turn it down. So Big Jack, so along that same line, if anyone runs calibration to level match, zero should be your reference for consumer AVRs. So agree or disagree. Ryan would suggest that it doesn't have to be. If I want my reference to be negative 20 on my AVR or processor, I, mean, it could. I, should have that, I should have that right to do that. But Odyssey will set it at zero, correct? It tries to. It tries yeah. to. As accurate as the microphone that's bundled with it, that's mass manufactured yeah. is, it tries yeah. to do that. And it's yeah. usually, in my experience, within a dB or two. Yeah, it's, it's pretty close. close. Now, should we talk about that it's possible that you are not getting reference if you're sitting off axis. Yeah. I mean, all the reference. Oh yeah. Anything can happen yeah, off axis, thing, but yeah. all those reference calibrations <laughs> are for the middle seat as far as yeah, your SPL. So I think that's also important to bring into account that, you know, okay. if you're sitting closer to a speaker really close, you may be getting blasted and <laughs> cause you're having a 60 yeah. B fall off for every doubling of distance. <laughs> so there's this. potential that if you're sitting a lot closer to a speaker and it's trying to get that volume mm -hmm. to the a seat that's far away from you, you may be in for a bad time, potentially. This is awesome, man. I love the comments, man. He says, too much tension for a Sunday evening. No. And uh, no, here it is. Uh, Tito, what have you done? Well, <laughs> so I'm having like a day, said, evidently. This, this is how we have fun. I mean, literally, like, I want us to have open discussions that, and, and part of it is we're processing as we're talking too. You know what I'm saying? Like we're figuring out, okay, where's the disconnect between what Ryan's thinking and what me and Jonathan are well, thinking? Obviously right? everybody else was wrong. Well, I mean, nobody <laughs> in the chat <laughs> agreeing with me yet, but there's that. Uh, this is uh, a good question. Are SPL it. meters all the same? Um, no. Good, no. Good question. They're going to be a subject to the same variance that your bundled microphone is going to be unless you get very expensive ones that are considered calibrated, and they have them. But you're talking hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, for calibrated SPL meters mm -hmm. that are, like, really top of the line. Mm -hmm. I bought two of them from Amazon that were $30 a piece, $25 a piece. I put yeah. them side by side, and if I did a clap test, the impulse response measured very different between them, up to, like, 15 mm -hmm. dB difference with just a simple clap test, and, and the tips were right next to each other. Now the, like if you're just doing a uh, like a pink noise and you and you're measuring it, they were within a couple dB. So mm -hmm. you know when it's not an impulse response, it's just a steady sound. They were pretty much the same, but man, impulse response that was very different between just two inexpensive ones. So you might think, man, I'm listening to stuff so much louder with that one SPL meter, and it's just the way it measures. Yeah. How fast it's doing its cycling, for instance, could be part of that. Well, is it cycling multiple times per second or just once every couple seconds? You well, know, and you that, brought up a good point earlier about the calibration mics. I mean, Odyssey's mics can be <clears> way <throat> different. Up to get 6 dB? 5, but five. you're close. Plus yeah. or minus 2.5 dB, which is yeah. 5. And that's so, within tolerance, right? There, That's yeah. totally allowed. Right. So if you have something outside of tolerance a little bit, yeah, then you're 6, 7, 8 dB off. And then if you're trying to say, well your reference is this and your reference is this, you could be as much as five DB apart, mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy. But which is, so I guess that does is it bring close up, enough. So I use the top T's like it's close enough. digital meter as well. So how do we know what the tolerance of, of say that are? A lot of these things on the Amazon, I mean, they're just cheap Chinese stuff, right? right? Because you don't, you don't. Will they provide us that information? Or, They'll say like plus or minus two dB or something in the okay. documentation that I was kind of casually reading on Amazon, okay. but who but then, knows? Yeah. You know? Then you don't even really know yeah. that. And I think it's, if you can do it, use a measurement mm -hmm. mic. That's why I bought two of them. Cause I wanted to make sure that I had an Omni mic and I calibrated them. And these were truth be told, my Omni mic is calibrated, right? It's $300 mic. 
These measured within two or three dB of my Omni mic. Mm -hmm. My Omni mic was actually reading a little lower than these. Okay. Um, so, so roughly, I mean, it's it's better than nothing, right? To have right. something that's twenty five dollars and gives you an idea. Did you right. check? And I don't know. I'm just curious. Did you check that at multiple frequencies? Was it consistent? I was just doing it with the receiver test tone noises, like the built in Denon Morant's receiver test tone noises. That's what I test with. But and then the clap test, of course, I was testing with that too. Mm -hmm. Now, people try to say I'll use my phone as an SPL meter because I got an app. Mm -hmm. That's bad. They don't usually, they're not very accurate at all. You yeah. you could be five or eight dB off with this either way. And so this is going to be a better option because it's purpose designed for that, yeah. for that function. So since we're talking about SPL meters, the question came up, how do you calibrate an SPL meter with another SPL meter? Well, you'd have no. to know that one no. SPL no. meter is right. No, you'd have to buy one that's like upper end that would even allow you to do it. These don't, these don't. You would have to have a fine, you would have to know that one is correct. Like you right. would have to know that this is actually right. So that's why I brought up the point of calibration mics. I mean, if it's been calibrated for X volume, then theoretically you could calibrate an SPL meter off of a calibration see mic okay. to see what its SPL was reading. So typically we way. talk about calibration mics. We're talking about a U mic one from mini DSP, U mic two, mm -hmm. Omni mic, um, Dayton Audio, I think makes one as well. Earthworks, so there's a bunch of different companies. Are those all because they're a calibrated microphone, does that necessarily mean that they're all calibrated to the same SPL? Is there any variance oh, in the U mics? I, they're supposed to come with a calibration file. They do. So they they do. should be I'm all wondering. individually calibrated within probably a half a dB or okay. something. So they the should mic. be pretty accurate if they're a yes. calibrated microphone. Yeah. If okay. you're getting the cal file and you're inputting it in your system, that's sure. important to do that. You can't. <laughs> a calibrated mic doesn't mean jack squat if you don't use the calibration file. Because at that they, point, it's just off the factory, just like anything else. They don't well, have any then, for it. How do you know that the first calibrated mic ever is ever calibrated? I know. <laughs> These are good questions, man. <laughs> you got to you gotta have trust <clears throat> at some point that yeah. they're basing things off of a known vari variable. But Yeah. So I think to me, what I've always recommended on my channel is, yes, it's good to have an SPL meter. And I love level matching all my speakers. Even if you're... SPL meter isn't super accurate. At least you may not be, I guess, calibrated to reference. And in a way that's kind of arbitrary. It's not that big of a deal. We're always adjusting volume based on our preference. So if negative 30 is ear piercing to you, then you're going to be listening lower than that. If zero is ear piercing to you and that's not comfortable, you're going to be about negative 10 or negative five or negative 15. So we're going to adjust the volume based on our personal preference. And like we talked about earlier in the show, dependent upon the medium or the media that we're consuming, that may have variables there. But to me, the biggest thing is just being able to have consistent between your channels. So if I'm using, let's say, the Top T's microphone, even if it is off by 2 dB, all of my speakers are going to be off by 2 dB. So that should be fine correct or could i measure it one speaker and then measure another one and that could be the variance of 2 db no no okay. it should so be they would be consistent in the same device okay unless you have a piece of crap <laughs> yeah you need to find another brand so, so so to me i think that's the bigger importance is just making sure that they're all level matched ollie brings up a point that not every calibration file is unique to that mic on the U mic one. It's unique to the batch of production. Yeah, that makes sense. That's not cool. That's interesting. That's cool. I, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's for every individual. I don't have a Omni mic is for every individual one. You have a serial number on it and they give you a cal file for that serial number. Yeah, but they, sell one for for yeah, but they don't know. You don't know. Phones. You don't know what, if that calibration file is different than the one with I've the looked serial. at multiple Omni mic physical files. They're different. Yeah, but is are they from different batches? Uh, who knows? Ollie, where did you? You're, you're get assuming, that info? Jonathan. You know how much trouble we can get <laughs> assuming stuff, right? Hey, I'm uh, I'm asking Ollie to to verify. Right, Ollie, man. do you have the <clears throat> link or anything for that info? I'd be interested in that just to yeah. see where where that's from. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, but it'd be interesting if it was. So Maybe. I see a lot of comments in here still saying that people are confused about all this and it's not making sense to them. So let's let's break this down a little bit yeah. more. Like Should we it. start over? 
Maybe. Yeah, all welcome again. to the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Episode two. All right, here's where Ryan gets mad again. Let's do it That's again. Right. Fire him up. Uh, but let's let's start over and say like what reference volume is, and then yeah. kind of why it's important, and then sure. the calibration, and I think maybe. So THX reference was defined in the 1970s by George Lucas's THX film stuff. It is meant to be 85 dB normalized volumes with 105 dB peaks, so that speaking voice so that just normal interactions on thing are about an 85 db level and there's peaks like dynamic peaks of volume that hit 105 db from your main listening position so that's so that could be your gunshots that could be explosions yes cars that's, again, up engines designed to not damage your ears so it's kind of like a high water mark that won't hurt humans ears mm -hmm. each speaker should be calibrated to hit that that level that they defined and then you can change it subjectively from there but that gives you a starting point the subs are not the same. The subs are designed to have, instead of 20 dB of headroom, they're designed to have 30 dB of headroom. So instead of hitting 105 from your seats, your subs are supposed to have dynamic peaks to go up to 115. Lower frequencies, because of pleasure munching curves and so forth they've studied out, they don't affect our ears as bad. So they give you a little bit more dynamic room in the base. Your receiver, if you have a consumer receiver, typically the main brands I'm aware of, Onkyo, Pioneer, Marantz, Denon, mm -hmm. consumer brands off the retail shelf, they offset, instead of 20 dB, which is the THX reference, they offset it by 30 dB. So, so if you this do is a what gets tone, confusing to people. Yes, and I'll explain why. When you do a test tone with your Marantz or your Denon or your Onky or whatever, you're going to set it to 75 dB instead of 85 dB. And the reason they did that is because 85 dB is kind of loud. And if you have a little junkety speaker, like a little bookshelf speaker that's like a TV speaker or something, you're trying to set it to 85, they were blowing tweeters. And so they're like, look, we don't want to blow someone's product when we're just trying to set the test tones. If they're not ever going to listen to reference anyway, let's knock it down 10 dB more. 75 is not going to blow any tweeters. Mm -hmm. So we'll do the offset for 30 dB and then we'll internally calculate it and make it for 85. So you're not actually the 75 versus 85 throws people up, but it's really just an internal offset. Like you mm -hmm. don't you don't have to worry about that. The receiver's doing it for you. If your receiver or processor does not do that offset, then you need to calibrate it to 85 dB. And 85 dB is just the normal threshold and that gives you the 20 dB peaks. For subs, you also calibrate them to 85 and the receiver and the processors know that it has 30 dB headroom. So you're not putting your subs at 80 or, or 95, you're still doing the test zones at 85 with the subs and then um, 75 on Den and Marantz, 85 for Boutique. And then that 30 dB of offset is set there with the, with the subwoofers. Does that make sense? Is that cleared up? Yep, it does. So my question is, if I'm calibrating to, and and really I'm asking this because I think a lot of people have the same question, is if I'm calibrating my system, I'm using an SPL meter, I'm using the internal of my Marantz, we know that that uses 75 as the volume internally, it's interpreting that it's adding 10 dB. So it's calibrating the system to 85, but what I'm hearing is 75 and that's what I'm using to Correct. match. Yes. How do I know what my offset is for my AVR? Let's say I have a pioneer. You How do I know that that's you, but where? It would be on the owner's thread on AVS, or you could just do a web search for it. You'll find that. That's not okay. hidden information. So that's they will pretty say, common to find. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Like Storms is in their manual. It's okay. Because I always assume a lot that of everybody kind of did it that way, but no, maybe that's not the case. And that's good to know. So Arkham, that would be interesting. Let's see if we can find what Arkham's because someone mentioned Arkham's. Okay, cool. Arkham if reference you share your screen, DB offset. Okay. So reference DB offset is what you're searching for with your AVR or processor. And just out of curiosity, I'm going to see if I can do the monolith HTP1 reference DB offset. Let's see if I can find that. Well, I hope this would be like a first hit Google link, but it's yeah. not. Yeah, see, Jonathan, let's see how easy this is for folks. All right, they're saying page 61. Oh. I'm going to bet it's in the owner's manual. Huh. Okay, Let's there we go. Reference of offset. Let's tone to it and see what if that helps us. 
Okay. So <laughs> the Uh-oh. first hit on Google when I added test tone was a page made by me. <laughs> of course, Jonathan's going to be the source of his about. own comments. Asking w- for, a, for everyone to pipe in on what the receivers are. So we had a co- compilation site of uh, the different things. In that, I have forgotten, Arkham is 75. So that, okay. <laughs> there you go. So Arkham is calibrated 75. What about mm. Monolith? I don't, don't have that me. one in my list. Okay. Need to add it, man. What do you? I'm adding this to the that? Discord. You're adding what? That page that we found okay. of Jonathan's. So that's good information to know that not every manufacturer sets their test tones at the same internal calibration volume. So, so here, you know, as as you're stopping mm-hmm. there for a second, we you can test this too. If you play something, and I'll give you a, a perfect example. If you turn off your subs and you just play your LCR and you okay. do Book of Eli, the town right. shootout, where the, he's right. firing the guns from the roof and they're trying to shoot him in the backpack, yep. those are recorded right at peak reference. And I've tested this on several systems. Nice. Just the LCR, turn off everything else. You right. should be hitting about 104, 105 dB with each of those mm-hmm. gunshots. And if you're right. not, then you're with your with uh, here we get into the impulse response question too, but but that's the target. Those okay. gunshots are supposed to be right at that limit, right. and they are. So yeah. if I do it with my Omni mic and I measure the max, it has to like a retain the max hit. Those are right. always 104, 105 dB range for each okay. of those channels. So that so that's your test. If you got a twenty dollars SPL meter, yeah. your luck may vary. I don't know how that's going to read. Sure. Um, here you go so, oh yeah. that one it moved on me here you go. i know it does that you guys are the best kind of nerds i love it man <laughs> appreciate the love man so nicholas brings up a thought here he says okay so kind of to wrap this up and make sure he's understanding this he says so just to confirm i ran pink noise test on at negative 20 and i got 85 db average with my system in stereo mains only then i disconnected the right main and got 82 then I switched to 5.1 and switched off my subs and got 90 dB average at negative 20. Every individual small? speaker should be 85 on that mm-hmm. with your test on yeah. big noise. Not not summed, not wow. from subs, not from two or three speakers playing at once, one speaker at a time. It is also going to be important to note that what your crossover point is, depending on how you're doing these test tones, right? If you're actually using the test tone generator in the AVR or the pre, or you're just playing them back Mm -hmm. and the type of test tone that is being utilized that is being played and what frequencies are actually being played during that test tone. And if your speaker is even actually, depending on the speaker, if it's actually reproducing those frequencies, depending on the Mm -hmm. test tone, otherwise it may not be accurate. You know, we've talked about this before, how modes and nulls affect your room mm-hmm. from your speakers. Okay. Sure. Traditionally, like the Disney Wow Disc is like an 800 to 2000 hertz test tone. Like it's pink okay. noise with a limited range. It's 800 to 2000 hertz. Okay. What if you have a nice little dip because of a room boundary interaction there and you're cranking mm-hmm. it up 5 dB, but it's only a suck out at those ranges and yep. all of a sudden now everything else is louder. So there's there's some little mm-hmm. idiosyncrasies with this. Sure. It's not a perfect science. Okay. There's a lot that can go into this. For sure. I mean, you could measure specific frequencies and then take an average and then like like a hurt test tone and then do a bunch of them. And so you're not doing pink noise or white noise or whatever mm-hmm. you're doing. You can, There's ways to do it, but just be careful when you do it, because it's very easy to fall into a pit and have a hard time climbing out. OK, Nicholas, turn off that summing. You don't want any of that for your for your individual SPL trims. Every one of those speakers and every one of those subs should be calibrated individually mm-hmm. so that you got it. Your, I, I take that back. Your subs should not be. Your subs should be summed if you have a single single LFE out, but your mm-hmm. speakers should all be individual. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's looking for SPL meters now. Calibrated mics. Calibrated mics is the way to go for that. Yeah. It's much more accurate. Yeah. So, okay. So along the same lines, I've heard, all right, so you can either use the most AVRs, not all of them, but most AVRs should include internal test tones. So I can go into my Marantz, my Denon, and go to the levels, and I can go to my front left, and it'll go, and go to my center. 
So those are internally coming from the Marantz. Many people suggest not using those when calibrating to reference and instead using a third party pink noise generator, such as a, a calibration disc, maybe the Spears and Munsell or the WOW, Disney WOW disc. Um, and my understanding, I think, is what they were saying is one of those does not take into account the, I guess, the EQ, like say with Odyssey. Is that correct? And does that even matter? I don't think the Denon and Morantz test tones take into account EQ. I, I've i heard that there's a difference there, and I don't know the difference. I'll be honest. Like yeah, I I'm just, I don't I've heard people is. mention that. They're like, hey, you really shouldn't be using the internal, and here's why. You should be using a, you know, this third-party disc external from your AVR, but I never really got a good explanation on to why, but I think that ties in with this conversation. If we're trying to calibrate to reference, if we feel that that's important, then do we need to use a third party SPL or third party pink noise generator? And does that matter? Uh, uh, <laughs> let's put the cart behind the horse here. I think for the most part, just getting the guys to do the internal receiver calibrations with an SPL meter and make That'd sure it's is, is a long way in the right direction. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Cause the truth is I've measured in my room. I remember, I think I had, my Eclipse La Scala's up front. I had um, RS62 version 2. So they're wide dispersion speakers for surrounds. And I remember Odyssey was way off. I mean, we're not talking a dB. We're not talking 2 dB. We're talking like 5 dB off. And I'm going, that's weird. Now, part of that could have been, and this is probably is another subject. I probably shouldn't even go there, but I may have been bottomed out on my lcr because they were so efficient that <laughs> it, you know you know what i'm going you're at here. negative 12 and it couldn't go any lower yeah it may have needed to go to negative 15 so that could, yes. now thinking back that might could have been the big variance there but i just remember having to increase my surrounds quite a bit higher than odyssey had had leveled them and odyssey still had more room to go but i had to manually go in there and and do that so that could have been it so that may be something totally different uh, KK Somebody says, said in the chat, show us in the menus. I'll do it real quick because I got okay, access cool. to it. Let awesome. Me Can you show us? Sure. You rock, Jonathan. So See, this is what we want to do, guys. We want to provide as much information for you and be as, as resourceful. Look at you, dude. He's already plugged in. Via Can the... you see? I assume yes. Yes. Okay, so this is just the Marantz homepage. It looked the same within in Marantz as far as mm -hmm. the web interface. Most yeah. of these receivers are going to have it. And if you don't have it in the web page, you can just go through the GUI, the on-screen GUI. Mm -hmm. So I'll go to speakers. And on the button. I'll go to levels. And you can see that these things all have these individual trims. Mm -hmm. Well, these trims have been set, and I've double-checked them, triple-checked them in my main listing position. So that every one of those is 75 dB on down the list. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where that is. So, you know, you take your SPL meter, you hold it about ear height, main listening position, and you and you add it a half dB or a less, and you change it mm -hmm. to where it's appropriate. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. Um, interestingly that, enough. That's going to be a little bit different in each AVR. So Yamaha is going to be yep. a little bit different place. But there, you're looking for something in your setup menu, typically under speakers, and then it should say something like levels. Or some someone may call it trims, but I think most of them call it levels. And, and what Ryan or what Michael was talking about that you want to be wary of is if any of these things are at their limits, like mm -hmm. say it's at negative 12 and it can't go any lower, right. your receiver is saying, I'd like to cut that more. I can't. I only it have this could, much of a yeah. threshold to do. And so you're not going to, it's not going to be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, if your speaker is all the way up here at plus 12, it can't get any louder and it's trying to make it louder. So you don't want any of these things to be at the limits. If they are, um, there's some solutions for it. They require attenuators or boosters, like either way, uh, depending on which side it is. Yeah. Um, or you just should get different speakers potentially to match. Oh, whatever, man. That's hard to do. It's hard to have 12 La Scalas in a room. That's uh, <laughs> Well, so like, if you had a super sensitive speaker like Michael's that's 102 dB or whatever it is sensitive, and these are at negative 12? Yeah. 
then you would, if you had an external amp, and this only speaks to external amps, they have what's right. called attenuators. And we've talked about that in a different show. There's both RCA and XLR. And they just look like a little dummy plug, if you will, that goes in the signal line and it attenuates the signal so that mm -hmm. the, the signal coming out of the processor, the AVR, is less that mm -hmm. goes to the amplifier to be amplified. And yeah. so then it lets you get out of that negative 12. You're up here in negative six or negative four type range. You know, yeah. you can get them for different amounts. It could be a negative six dB attenuator, a negative 10 dB attenuator, a negative 15 or, a, you know, a attenuator. So they have these different, these different levels that you can buy of them too. Yeah. Um, I can pull those up real quick to show you what those look like. Yeah. They just kind of sit in up. line between the amplifier and the processor or your AVR? Yeah. So, so here's an RCA style. This is a three dB attenuator. Share your other screen, Jonathan. Oh yeah. Sure. Have to, yeah. Cause it, it's looking at your, that tab maybe. Okay. Present stop screen, present share now screen and then go to parts express. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Thanks. So like here's a 20 dB XLR attenuator. Here is a 3 dB RCA attenuator. And they have all, all the different numbers. I mean, here's 6 yeah. dB RCA. Here's 10 dB attenuator. And they just, like Michael said, they just go in line. They just, one end clips into your processor, one end clips into the XLR cable that goes to the amp or RCA either way. All right. Let's uh, let's move on, I suppose. Huh? <laughs> so, no, but I, it, the, all of that ties in together. So to me, I'd rather address all that in one like group instead of going to other comments about different subjects and then coming back to that. But, but I think that totally fit with um, what we were talking about. So should we yeah. now talk about reference capable speakers and why that's important? One, one side show before we do, someone asked about Yamaha. They're at 75 as well. That's yes. in that, okay. that list. Arkham, Denon, Morantz, Onkyo, and Yamaha are confirmed to be at 75. Storm 75. is at 85. Okay. Um, we don't know what Anthem is. Okay. Or Monoprice. We didn't find that yet either, did we? Yeah, no. I didn't see Who else are we missing? Monoprice. Emotiva. Don't know what they're using. Mm -mm. I don't have, I don't, it's not confirmed what Chernov is using. Pioneer. I mean, Pioneer's not on there. You said Onkyo. Integra yeah. would probably be the same as Onkyo. Onkyo. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, if you don't know this answer, if you go to the owner's thread on your particular processor and ask the question, what's my reference DB offset? Okay. People come out and help you. Yeah, sure. And they may just give you their opinion and you're still in the same boat. <laughs> can right. happen, man. Can happen. So off the software side, hardware, speakers. Okay. So it, Why let is me having put, a capable speaker important? All right, so let me put this back up. So we're talking about, is reference volume important for home theater? So along that same line, is it is it important to have reference capable speakers? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So that suggests that not all speakers are capable of hitting and maintaining reference without distortion or what we consider um, compression. compression. Correct. Okay. And there's a lot fewer speakers, I think, than people realize that are actually capable of doing this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, y'all were challenging me last week or two weeks ago about clips not being able to hit reference. I'm like, oh, buddy, I think you need to come over and have a demo because I promise you they're able to do that. Not all of them because they've got different tiers as well, but they definitely have some speakers in um, the reference RF 73s easily would be able to do that. The La Scala's absolutely would be. Um, I mean, your, your ears are going to give out long before your AVR and your processor will. But I, you say ears are going to give out. I also think it's really important to mention that distortion. your ears typically give out a lot sooner when you encounter distortion. I'm not saying that's what's happening with the clips, but sure. I think it is yeah. important to note. Yeah. Um, if you I don't think I've ever done compression testing on speakers. I've only done it on subwoofers. So this is why I think when we had our, you know, almost to fisticuffs coming across the, <laughs> the stuff here, it... Yeah. People, I think a lot of times run into the situation where they're like, oh, this is way too loud. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it's because they're encountering distortion. I, I think that happens a lot more than people think it does. Yeah. Because if you are listening to clean audio, you can listen to, it's not necessarily good for your hearing, 
So mm-hmm. that is a caveat. Yeah. But you can comfortably listen way louder than mm-hmm. you would think you otherwise could. Um, it's kind of remarkable how loud you can listen without mm-hmm. distortion and listen not comfortably, but not remarkably uncomfortably where it's hurting your ears okay um, so food for thought uh, why are speakers why would a reference capable speaker be important um, i think a big reason that it's important is dynamics dynamic range um, a thing that people a lot of times overlook is when you're eqing something right if i'm having to boost slightly a frequency Let's say I'm already on the fringes of what a speaker is capable of, but now my room EQ or manual EQ is boosting a speaker in a certain range and I'm already at its limit. Well, now I'm pushing past said limit and potentially encountering compression and distortion. So having a speaker that it just like having an amplifier that is more than capable of what you're going to be utilizing it for, I think you want to have the same type of capability in a speaker because you don't want to stress it. Typically, the harder you stress a speaker, the more you're going to encounter distortion, and okay. we don't want distortion. So having a speaker that can cruise to those volumes is just going to be much easier to listen to and give it and provide a much more dynamic experience. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you some practical experience with this, too, to, to go with this. And I agree with everything you said, Ryan. Um Audiophile speakers, traditional style towers. I had Wharfdales for 10, 15 years. Uh, they were great towers. Wharfdale Sapphire, single soft stone tweeter on them, six and a half inch drivers times three, I think it was. One was right. mid range, two were woofers, right? Pretty traditional design. I used to listen to things that reference, come and go. The mm-hmm. main towers, I think, could more or less handle it without audibly doing something wrong that I could hear. The center channel always struggled, right? Because it would sound like a tin can with lead filled in it. You know, it was bad. Mm -hmm. But the towers, I thought, were doing it. Enter the realm of pro audio. I go Mm -hmm. over to a buddy's house. I watch the same demo clips. We've watched the same demo clips for years and years, a lot of cases, right? Glass breaks on the War of the World scene when the giant foot comes down and crashes the car. Mm -hmm. holy crud that glass tinkle is loud and sharp Mm -hmm. and wow my -hmm. wharf can't do that Mm -hmm. you look at the compression sweeps now that i know a little bit more you know fast Mm -hmm. forward 15 years yeah those wharf one inch soft dome tweeter it can't do that so Mm -hmm. i wasn't hearing what was on the content on the mastering because the speaker couldn't do it couldn't reproduce another example in the Caves of Mor- Mor- Mordor, Moria, whatever it was from Lord of the Rings, when the little yep. bucket falls down in the well, mm-hmm. the clink, clank, clink of the chain that falls down in the well mm-hmm. sounded great on the Wharfdales. I didn't have any problem. I listened to that reference. Sure. Like, listen to how great this went over right. at Sheldon's house with Pro Audio. Holy crud, that chain is loud. No wonder it woke up all the dwar- you know, all the all the orcs or whatever. Same sort of thing, right? It's a mm-hmm. it's a totally different level when your when your tweeter isn't compressing. Uh, yeah. Because it's 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 allowing a lot more sound to come through that you otherwise you're just missing out on mm-hmm. the gunshots in Book of Eli. Yeah, let's say your speaker Our it's hitting 104, 105 dB. Those are loud. Bang, yeah. hit you in the chest. If your yeah. speaker can't do it and it's only doing 95, and you think you're getting it, it may not mm-hmm. audibly sound bad. You're right. just missing that impact, the mm-hmm. hair on your head impact. Um, do you need to listen to reference? No, but it's a heck of a lot of fun. It's a heck of a lot of fun <laughs> on occasion, you know, when your speaker's capable and your system's capable. So Jonathan, would you kind of equate that to maybe a subwoofer that can't reproduce, say, really low frequencies? So let's say I'm watching um, Ready Player One when Kong lands on the uh, the freeway, when the, the dinosaur stomps, and when the wrecking balls hit, mm-hmm. I know from having subwoofers that are capable of hitting single digits, there's content really low. I don't know how low, but there's content really low. Mm -hmm. When I go to somebody's house and do maybe a home theater tour and they demo that same scene, I don't hear anything bad necessarily, Mm -hmm. but I'm missing missing. out on those. I'm missing out on those low frequencies that I know are there. So is that somewhat similar to what you're saying with a reference uh, speaker that's not capable of hitting reference? you're missing out on the dynamics that are 
that were built mm-hmm. into that scene mm-hmm. that really draw you into that, mm-hmm. um, that portion of that movie. And it sounds good. It looks good, but you're just not getting the full picture. And you may not even know it. Yes. I think mm-hmm. that's fair. I try to come up with some cool analogies every once in a while. Minds of Moria. Someone, someone gave me the mm-hmm. correction. That's Chris. Yeah. Appreciate that, Chris. Nice, man. So final thought on that. Is it important to have to listen at reference or to calibrate to reference? We, I think we agree. We should calibrate to reference. Mm-hmm. That agreed. Ryan may so disagree. We all can talk the same language. I think so. <laughs> yeah. You may yeah. not calibrate it to zero on your knob being referenced, but you still should calibrate to reference. Yes. And know what that offset is if you don't yeah. do zero. Mm-hmm. Sure. Definitely. <laughs> That'd be a good demo Chris, right there. Reference. Chris is going. Uh, I could see that. And it's important to do that because it establishes a benchmark. It makes it very easily comparable to other things. And if you don't start from a fundamental starting place how can you move with everybody else so here's a prime example along with that same line if i were because somebody mentioned this you know what if my avr does not have um it doesn't measure the volume in decibels it just has a zero to a hundred scale so if i were to turn on to switch in the Marantz, you can either choose the relative scale which is relative to reference, which is negative dB up to positive dB. Um, but it also has a, what I would call absolute volume, which would be like zero to 99 or zero to a hundred. My zero to a hundred scale on a Marantz is probably going to be different on a Yamaha. It's probably going to be different on an Onkyo. So, you really don't know what reference is from zero to a hundred. And that's why in my video, I actually did one on level matching your speakers and how to do that and the importance of doing that. And that's why I suggested in that video, go ahead and go into your settings, look for a, I think it's in the general volume setting in the Marantz and then on. Um, and then you can change it from relative to absolute or absolute to relative. Um, so, but not I, every, not every I AVR has that ability. Think, Michael, if you toggle back and forth, if you put it on zero in your Marantz or Denon okay. and you switch the scale back the other way, I it think shows. zero references 81.5, I think. Okay. Interesting. Which is a strange number, but I, yeah. that's what's coming ahead. I'm trying to look it up online to confirm okay. that's right. Interesting. I, by my mind, I would think it would be 82, but I, yeah. I think it's, I think I recall it's not 82 for some reason. Trying to okay. find if I if I find I'll let you know. And what's interesting is I don't even know if it does. Well, I guess it does do half increments on the volume. Yeah, main listening volume. Yeah. Um, and and you can also I think there's some some logic to that to some degree. Like if you turn your Marantz or Denon or Onkyo products, all of them. Mm-hmm. And your say your channel trims aren't in the positive, you should be able to go to plus 18 above reference, which you shouldn't do but you can right if you're if there's nothing playing you just max out your main listening volume it'll probably go to plus 18 so if you cycle that back that's why i think i was remember it should be 82 because 18 minus 100 is 82 mm. or, or 100 minus 18 is the right <laughs> order for that right, right. um but i but i don't think it i think it somehow is 81.5 and i and i'm hmm. trying to remember why at any rate that goes to your point of like what should you do if you don't have the relative to reference it would be uh, and you're only on absolute volume, then you would you could you could just set it to eighty one point five if you wanted, but that's another thing like kind of the earlier discussion. Like you would have to know what that means. Cause if you tell someone you're listening at negative or if you listen right. at 80, 84 volume or right. seventy nine volume, you know what you're talking yeah. about. Right. There there's yeah. there's no nothing to correlate that to. As Ryan said, different Ryan. Yeah. Zero is just a way to keep track of things. It's not sure. specifically reference unless you intentionally set it up to That's actually great. match ref- reference. Level. I counter that, Ryan Kramer, because it does intentionally set it up that way if you run an auto EQ or tries to, tries mm-hmm. to. 
Yeah. So, yeah, that's but the goal, I right? think what Ryan is saying is that unless is it intentionally set that way, which the room EQ is intentionally setting it that way. True. Yeah. I think that's what he's maybe meaning. Yeah. yeah. If you just buy it out of the box and you turn it to zero, you have no idea. Like, Probably going to break something. Yeah. That's not reference. Probably not the best idea. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Or if your volume knob gets stuck on increasing with the, <laughs> you're probably going to break something. <laughs> Nothing broke in your basement. Yeah. Our ears. Our ears. <laughs> but that was, that was really loud. Let's yeah. not do that again. I think that was, seriously, that was a great conversation. If you enjoyed the conversation, if you like this style of format where we're answering a question or talking about a specific topic at the beginning, let us know. Um, and uh, that's kind of the thought going forward. We want to try to do that at the beginning of the show. And then uh, once we've kind of wrapped up that, then we'll go on to answering some. Well, I'm going to we're gonna pull you back here because there was a good yeah. question that yeah, came certainly. in at the end. Explain okay, the cool. DB loss power requirement at different seating distances. So this is something that oh, I comes up quite frequently when you're trying okay. to calculate. And it's a very rough equation like this isn't there's so many variables that come into this that it you can't use this as finite like this is what it's going to be it's just a, mm -hmm. a kind of a basic under rounding of what's that could be potentially happening so if you li have a volume at one meter whatever typically your sensitivity at one meter at 2.83 volts mm -hmm. so if i had say that's 100 db to make it easy your speaker mm -hmm. is 100 dB sensitive, getting 2.83 volts at one meter. Mm -hmm. For every doubling of distance, so if I go from one meter to two, two meters, okay. I lose 6 dB. If I go from, so now I'm at 94. If I go from two meters to four meters, I lose another 6 dB. So now I'm at 88, and it keeps doubling. Now this can work to your advantage. This is part of why having big rooms can be very beneficial because the further you are away from a speaker, the wider that area is, right? So if I'm now four meters, if the main listening position is four meters away from the speaker to lose 6 dB, I now have to go from four meters to eight meters. So it's a much larger gap. So you're able to keep a consistency across multiple seating positions if you're further away from the speaker to begin with. Yeah, but yeah, I see what you're saying. But you have to do that to begin with. What do you mean? Like your first row needs to be pretty far from the screen. Yes, but th th my point is, is that I bigger see. rooms, it's an advantage for having consistency over so multiple. More consistency in volume versus Correct. my room. I mean, I'm nine feet, but even then I'm nine foot from to the first row, but then I'm only 14 feet to the next row. So I wouldn't really experience anything because I'm not doubling that distance. So nine foot, you'd be at two, three meters, mm -hmm. right? So oh, maybe down. But you have room, you have boundary gain, and you have There's all that other lot, stuff that yes yeah. makes it real fuzzy. It can right. absolutely. In my room, ten foot of distance from the screen, twelve foot of distance from the screen, in that area drops about ten dB. So. Okay that's how it works out in my room. It's a little different in each room, but it's in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. So if you're at nine foot, you're probably down nine or 10 dB. Would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe eight dB, depending on how much yeah, boundary gain you get. It's very rough. Like this isn't me saying this is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Virtually always it's less because you've so, got a bunch of gain going on in the room. So that even brings up another thought that when we were talking about reference capable speakers your seating distance from that speaker can be further as a great impact so if you sit 14 foot 15 foot 18 foot from your speakers versus maybe i'm only sitting five foot in my living room or seven foot in my living room that's going to be a big difference than mm -hmm. somebody else so you may be able to get away with a speaker that isn't as reference capable in a small room closer. Correct. Right. Okay. So I think a lot of times people can run into the misconception that, oh, my speaker is capable of 105 dB. Well, a lot of times that means 105 dB at right. one meter. So mm -hmm. now if you take our rough calculation, you say, well, for every doubling of distance, you lose 60 dB. And let's say you're listening at four meters. Well, you lose 60 dB going from one to two, and then you lose another 60 dB going from 
two to four. So now you're 12 dB down yeah. just to your main listening position. So now instead of 105, you're getting 93. Yeah. Which is you not to crank the volume up considerably to be able to get back to that 105. Well, that would be all your speaker would be capable of if that's oh, I see, I see what you're maximum power handling is 105. But if you misinterpreted that mm -hmm. and said, oh, this is reference capable, you're not going to be able to get that at your yeah. main listening position. And that's really important for people to realize. And this mm -hmm. is another reason why having more capable speakers is very mm -hmm. important because you are not going to be getting the one meter volume. Your speaker is going to have to be pumping out way above that mm -hmm. in order for you to perceive that at your main listening position. And then let's talk about EQ briefly. Odyssey can apply 9 dB of EQ plus or minus mm -hmm. out of the box. That's their allowed tolerance. Okay. You add 9 dB of EQ, that's quadrupling the power. So at that frequency range, you're using a lot more power. You're running out of speaker headroom. Potentially, it's nice to have a little bit of EQ room, a headroom, and you're mm -hmm. picking out your speaker. If you're talking green pasture stuff, making your choices. Yeah. There was another question. Nicholas had some stuff I want to address real quick. If if Yeah, no, go ahead. Hit it. Okay, so this is cool. He's doing some on the fly stuff while we're doing yeah, this. And he found out that. with his meter that, hey, my stuff was off, and now I fixed mm -hmm. it. You know, so he's he's in here doing the work. Good job, oh, Nick. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. And then a little further yeah. down, he has a follow up question as he's still working through that. And I mm -hmm. will try to find it real quick. Okay. He's saying, what do I do my subs? Because my subs are summed and I can't do them individually. Is this the one? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you would drop subs sum. And this is, again, general terms. If your subs are not if they're not stacked on top of each other or side by side co-located, then they're they're only going to add 3 dB each. So effectively, if you had two identical subs with two identical amps on them, and they're on front corners of the room, left and right, then you add 3 dB. So you're going to drop, you're going to, instead of doing them 75, you're going to put it at 72 and 72. And then you're going to crank it 10 or 12 dB because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't like reference level bass. I want my bass hot. But, yeah. but if you're trying to do it by the rules, it'd be 72 and 72. Okay. And, and that's fuzzy math, right? Because you might have boundary gain. It might be a little bit less or a little bit more than that. But but fuzzy math is 72. Okay. So where did this come up? Bible time. Yeah, I was. I saw that one too. Question about reference capable speakers. How does the sensitivity rating versus power handling play into that? So this goes back to what I talked about when I started talking about a couple minutes ago about you know, your doubling of distance and your loss of 6 dB, you start with the sensitivity of your speaker. So you'd look at whatever the sensitivity rating is. And typically it's one meter with 2.83 volts is typically what you're going to get. So you can take, if it's 95 dB at one meter, if that's the sensitivity, then you start at one meter mm -hmm. with 95 dB, and then you double it to two meters, you subtract 6 dB. Now you're at 89. Double it again. Now you're at four, you're at 83, right? And you just keep doing that. So now to get that back, this is the part that we didn't talk about. Let's say you're at 83 dB arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. To get that back, let's say we're trying to get to 105 and we're not talking about EQ. We're using fuzzy math. We're just trying to keep this simple. For mm -hmm. every three dB you gain back, you double the power. So for 85, we're at one watt. If we go to 88, we're at two watts. 91, four, 94, eight, 97, 16, 132, 103, 64, 106, 128. And then remember, this is not talking about EQ. So mm -hmm. now if Odyssey has added, as Jonathan stated earlier, a three or a nine dB boost on top of that, well, think about how much power you're adding on to that. Four and what times amp, the power. The amp is having to deliver. So these are things that a lot of people don't think about and why it can be important to have an overabundance of power available mm -hmm. that you may yeah. think that you're not utilizing so that your amplifier can mm -hmm. deliver that. Now, you in quick blips, it's could or could not. 
necessarily be as much of a problem. Might not be audible. This is fuzzy, <laughs> so just take this with the We're grain of salt. a whole lot of fuzzy math here. Tonight, there yeah. is, because there's a lot of variables that go into this with the room, yes. with how this stuff is working, with the speakers and the amps and all different kinds of stuff. So this is just fuzzy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but that's let really me, how let me talk to this real quick because you're talking about this the compression sweeps we've mentioned on here a few times and we've talked about it a few times. Mm -hmm. Let's say you let's say you boost a null 9 dB and you probably shouldn't be doing that anyway, but let's just say you do it because you want your yeah. flat line in the main listening position. That's all you care about. So you've brought up one kilohertz 9 dB. As your amp starts running out of power, you do your compressor reads 5 dB, it looks the same. 5 dB it looks the same. Now your amp's starting to run out of power. That starts going back down. That 90 B no longer is 90 B boost. Now it's 60 B boost. Five more dB more. Oh, now we're down at like three dB boost and we got a big hole again. Five dB more. Now you got no boost at all. The amp's out of power. It can't give you that 9 dB boost there anymore. It doesn't have that headroom. So now you got this curve right back again at that top compression sweep and it goes back to kind of its native EQ. So that's how it reveals itself. Does that visualize okay without seeing mm -hmm. it? Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so what is it audible? Maybe not, right? I don't, it depends. It's so loud there. Things kind of change your room. Things are knocking around. Who knows? But, but it's no longer a flat EQ anymore because your amp's out of headroom. It can't, that can't deliver that extra four times. I think the power it could be, it would be audible given the correct tones. But one thing that we've noted, and I think this is a good segue into talking about directional bass, is a lot of times we're listening to things and there's so much going on mm -hmm. that our minds don't have a good opportunity to focus on anything and things just get blended together and you're not really able to notice. Things may be happening, right? but we may not be able to perceive them, right? And I think this is a perfect opportunity to segue out of this and talk about <laughs> your stuff with directional bass that we were oh, talking about, fun. that you talked so about I, at the beginning of this. Sheldon texted me, he's on the thing. Can we have a different discussion? Yeah, we could do that another time. <sighs> That could be I like got this I mean, that, segue, and because <laughs> that could, that could be like like that's the conversation, man. Let's you know it what I mean. Could be, but that'd be in the middle of a podcast. I wonder. Okay, fine. All right, let us know in the chat. Would you rather hit that now? Well, of course they want to hit it now because they're here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. You that's you got thirty me. seconds to make a decision. Michael. I'm gonna make, make a video on this too. So. Okay. You, you know, you could probably stay tuned on that as well. But okay, just wait then. All right, just hit it, man. I don't mind. I don't mind just saying it real briefly. Yeah. But but oh, the fun, here's the funny outcome, right? So I <clears throat> I listen to probably like fifty or sixty in clips, really intentionally, multiple movies, multiple games. Like spent three weeks with these directional bass and and what we're talking about here. If you guys haven't followed along well, to, the podcast, to I highlight got, what Chad is saying, hit the highlights and then do a deep dive another time. So ooh, just, sure, okay. there, there you go. go. I like it. So my there normal eight. 18s are arranged two in each corner and i did what's called directional bass with marantz they have ability to take all bass from the crossover point down from each speaker surround speaker and redirect it to the nearest subwoofer so your back right surround is feeding its bass i raised my crossover point to 120 hertz it's feeding its bass from 120 hertz down to that nearest subwoofer the idea being that the subwoofer that's closest to the surround speaker is getting that speaker's bass. And is it audible or not, right? That's the, the people are talking about, yeah, this is a champion idea. It's really good. It's really fun. I was reading some of that stuff. The new Marantz 2023, new Denon products have four subwoofer routes. They're all capable of it. Storm's capable of it to some degree, I think. Um, people are saying, yeah, I think it's a nice thing. And when I would ask, I, I would ask, like, well, give me some reference material that you think is the best to showcase this. And then there was crickets, you know, like, just listen to it and see what you think. All right. Well, I'm going to do some testing now because I want to know. So I listened to about 50 different clips intentionally flipping back and forth, different people listening, my father and I, and I mostly, and I only found four, four clips that seemed like they were subtly different. And the rest of it was throwaway differences that I couldn't tell. So then I invited two of my friends over. Sheldon and Tim last minute this last weekend. And I, I showed them those four clips that mm -hmm. I thought were the differences. Like these are the ones that I think sort of made a difference. And I'm going to blind test you and we're going to see what happens here. Right. They got every single answer wrong, except for one click from one guy. Mm -hmm. So I think if this was a Mythbusters episode and directional base was on the table, as far as what we're discussing, then it's busted because 
<clears throat> of the four clips I thought were the most notable, basically one out of eight answers was right. The odds should say you should get four out of four. And they didn't even, you know, like they didn't even get that. <clears throat> so it's it's weird because here's how <clears throat> here's how it unfolds. It works physically. I can mm -hmm. go to that subwoofer, and if there's something happening, like the Dolby Atmos Leaf demo was one of the ones that I said works, and I could, right. I thought I could subtly hear it. I could tell it was working. The little maple seed is going around the room, and the subwoofer is thump, 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 thump. As the maple seed's going around, you go touch that subwoofer or that subwoofer in the corner as that maple leaf goes around the room, and those subs are moving hard when that maple leaf's there and quieting down otherwise. But the LFE, the overall LFE from the track is going to all four of them. So it's just the speakers that's routed to the base and the LFE is going to everything. Right. What happens when you're in the main listening position is that's just not audible. You can go, you can feel it. You can tell it's doing it, but it's not, mm. it's not audible. So then the answer then is like, well, why don't you raise a crossover to hundred and from 120 Hertz, try 200 Hertz. I did, but I don't like a 200 Hertz crossover. That sounds no. cruddy for everything else. I'm not going to yeah, compromise yeah. the way everything else sounds for the directional bass. And it wasn't even subtle from there when I did a 200 Hertz crossover. So, so long story short, um, it didn't make a whole lot of difference. Now, what is interesting, there's a guy named Nala on the forums, and he's doing tactile transducers with directional bass. Okay. Now, just for the same reason I'm telling you, it does physically work. Right. If you did it with tactile transducers and he's putting a hover easy under each of his four foot on his chairs and he's doing it for multiple chairs, mm -hmm. that is going to work. And he okay. says it's awesome because your chair is lifting on the leg that's representing that where that sub is. So that's mm -hmm. a cool idea. It's kind of like a, a poor man's D box, if you will. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I want to go to that extreme to try to set that up. Do it. But I think it's a cool idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to push him. He's going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> All you gotta do is challenge him. He'll be like done. Yeah. So, so it's really funny mm, that video. I have the reactions of the guys that were over here, Tim and Sheldon, and most of the reactions were just like, "It's the same." I can't wow. tell. And then the couple times that they thought, "I think I got it," I think I got. They were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is like the traditional blind test stuff that we're all we're all so guilty yeah. of. That you you can't. And even I'm gonna be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna wrap myself out. Right. One of the things when I was testing these things, my father-in-law and I were doing the testing initially, and I didn't go through all the clips, all four of them, like real thoroughly 100%, like not in every case, like going back and forth and testing all the subwoofers and stuff. One of the four that I thought I could tell a difference from and my father-in-law thought I could tell a difference that we put into the selection pool that we thought was good, that wasn't even good. Like when I was physically touching the subwoofers, that was all in my head you know, to curate the discs, even to curate the tracks that we're using. So, so there was placebo all around. And then we, it wasn't, we didn't stop there. We listened to a bunch of other stuff. We listened to music. We played some uh, ready player one. They thought might be a good one with the monkey bouncing around King Kong, uh, you know, to see if that was directional. No, it wasn't directional. So, so long story short, don't buy a receiver based on directional base alone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't pan out that way. Yeah. Questions. I meant let's get to questions. Okay. Cool, man. We'll come back. I love to the that, discussion. Think, uh, yeah. So you're going to make a dedicated video on that on that subject, Jonathan? Yes, I plan to. I've already started it. Cool. So make sure you subscribe to Jonathan's channel so you can search for him, Jonathan Von England, um, on YouTube. And actually, there's a link in the description of this video. So... Finally got that added a while back. All right, let's jump to some questions, man. And so we may not answer, or we may not star too many more because we already got like twenty-five. Yeah. All right, here we go, Zach. Super chats. Super one chat. Of the DIY. Oh, my bad, my bad. I'll come back to you, Zach. You're right. I w man, one day Streamyard is going to put all my super chats. We up told to the them top. they should. That'd be so helpful. Home theater nerd, appreciate the five dollars super chat, Jonathan. Can you quantify? How much difference low back theater seats make? Do you hear surround speakers surround much better? I can, but you can do the test yourself. Put some pillows or something on your seats. Get your ear above the back of your current seats and give it a listen. It is a difference. I mean, clearly it's a difference because the seat backs block everything that's coming from behind you and you're getting it kind of overhead. You can still hear the stuff behind you, but it's not the same. Yeah. And if you, 
or pull your home theater seat out for a minute and just bring like a folding chair from the kitchen in or something, you know, like a, a wooden chair, a folding chair or something and sit there in that main seat and listen. There's well, a difference. If you have a home theater seat, put it all the way back and listen and that way up. and then put a pillow up and see, listen to it change. So all the way back so nothing's blocking and then put a pillow up and listen to the thing change. Don't do it with it all the way up. So Ryan, you bring up a good point. People have, have mentioned that to me that, oh, you really need to have these low back chairs in my theater room, in my setup. Every single time I'm watching a movie, I'm reclined. So I'm not at a yeah. full flat position, but I'm reclined, number one. But number mm -hmm. two, my side surrounds or rear surrounds are elevated and they're angled towards my listening position. So I never have any of that sound block. So for me, a high back chair is totally cool in my room. But mm -hmm. again, every room is different. So if your speakers are more at, at ear level or close to the height of your chairs, absolutely. That chair back position could block some of that sound because we know high frequencies and mid-range frequencies are very directional. And so anything that gets in the way of that is going to stop that sound. Yep. Mm -hmm. I went from a couch to home theater chairs to back to a couch for exactly this reason. And next he's buying a love sack. Uh, comfy sack. That's just a big, <laughs> just big, big eight foot bean bag. I'm actually just going to sit on the floor. <laughs> exactly. Nothing in the room. You can't bring yeah. anything in there. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Good oh question. shoot. You know what? Can somebody, I just unstarred Zach's comment. That's going to be hard to find. Cause it's going to be further up. Zach's. It would have been around eight o'clock. Is this a super or, chat? No, it was a regular. And I unchecked it thinking I was unchecking the home theater nerds question, but I unchecked his i'm looking i got it okay well, i'm perfect. looking all right his so name when was you zach? Get that, if you would just start back maybe his name was zach yes zach and it was before dave k2sb at 802 okay his says we'll I'm start looking. sw15 work so it's before that question so sorry about that zach i um, unchecked it mistakenly so let me go through the other super chats here so Bruce, appreciate the love, man. $2 super chat. I don't think you had a question. I didn't see one. Uh, so let me undo that one. Tito, appreciate the $2 super chat. He said, loved it. Almost got Ryan booted from the chat. <laughs> Close, man. It'd take a lot to get Ryan booted, man. We actually like him. He's a pretty cool guy. Sometimes. Yeah. Hulk thing, appreciate the $5 super chat. Hello, fellas. Just wanted to know. What would you prefer, Arendal 1723S, which is their smaller version, or the SVS Ultras, which is their flagship tower speaker for home theater? Just need a little help making the decision. I always love this. What would you buy? Questions. Do we, do we talk about M-Wave? I mean, we can, sure. So M-Wave, we did a speaker test, a blind yeah. speaker test. It was all bookshelves, but Arundel. And SVS were both part of it. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should preface by saying how the speaker test was actually done. So it was all blind mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the audience was sitting out. There were probably 50 people out there, but we encouraged people to move. We did bookshelves. They were mm -hmm. situated on a Lazy Susan, all connected to an eight channel amplifier. So they were all getting the same amount of power. Um, it was a Buckeye NC502. So they were all getting full amounts of power. It wasn't shared power. And then that was connected to a storm. So they were all SPL matched. And I would switch it so that everything was at the same volume. Mm -hmm. All the speakers were situated on top of a Lazy Susan so that every speaker when it played was in the exact same position. And we're doing everything mono in order to take imaging out of the equation. Mm -hmm. So you were only listening to one speaker in the exact same position at the same volume, potentially from the same listening position, depending on how you did it. And you right. were blind. You didn't know what you were listening to. So we tried to eliminate as many of these variables as possible. The SVS, along with Martin Logan, were pretty well universally liked by most. Um, Arundel came in third. So take that for what you will. They were all liked. Mm -hmm. SVS was liked more is the best way now, I can describe it. Yeah. And keep in mind, so we're comparing the Arndall. I think that was their the monitor. 1723 monitor mm -hmm. to the SVS bookshelf. Ultra bookshelf. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because these are all bookshelf speakers. They weren't any towers. So I'm assuming 
when he says, well, I guess we don't really know. The SVS Ultra could be Ultra Bookshelf or an Ultra Tower. Could I'm not be. sure what he's, he's interested in. Not sure. Um, so, and again, I would encourage you as best possible, if you can find a way to listen to them, listen to them. They're going to have their own unique sound. You may like, you know, some people listen to SVS and say, man, that's perfect speaker to me. Some love Clips, some love Arndel, some love Martin Logan. Um, so it's, it's important it, to it listen. Is, what's that? It's important to listen. Yeah. And so the good thing about the blind is it, it takes our preconceived biases out of the equation as best as we can. So instead of saying, oh, I should like this, or I'm not really familiar with this brand, so I probably won't like this, it kind of removes that. And so now you're just listening for the characteristics of the speaker itself and being able to make a decision on whether or not you like that. So, but yeah, super fun. So are we going to have another speaker comparison, you think, this year? I think so. I don't know okay. why we wouldn't. Okay. Um, so quick plug for M-Wave, man. If you're not familiar with it, come hang out with us. June the 21st through the 23rd. It's in Kansas City at the Kansas City Convention Center. We do three days of just hanging out, man, having some cool, cool demos from Dolby Atmos, full Dolby Atmos home theaters. We do some blind AV comparisons with projectors, with TVs. Um, yeah, I think they do those blind, right? I think they hide the logos, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've done subwoofer comparisons we've done cable comparisons so we just like to have some fun giving you experiences that you're not going to get anywhere else so we'd love to have you you can get tickets at midwestavexperience.com we'd love to have you join us it'll be super super fun this year and um but yeah man i can't find this question which okay i'm sorry was it Derek? you said zach Derek. zach zach if you're still in here if you don't mind drop your question and then we'll put that back to the top because yours was one of the first ones. It was way up there in a, um, like literally oh, the first hour. It was that far back. I found it. Yeah, that no, was it was eight o'clock roughly or before. Oh, you're eight o'clock. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. So that, that would be different on your end. Yeah, you said 8.02 yeah. and I found it right at 7.02. Okay, yeah, sorry. This all makes you sense found it? now. I did. yeah. I guess StreamYard shows me my current time or my time when it came in, I guess. Okay. It does. I didn't think about that. Cool. Great question, Hulk. Uh, short circuit. Appreciate the five pound. Is that the pound symbol? I think so. I'm not yeah. sure. But I think it's five pound. So appreciate that, brother. Uh, Michael, appreciate the $5 super chat. Love the content, guys. Uh, thoughts on the Q950 Kef versus the Arndall 1961, which are now discontinued. Uh, Kef Q950 Focal Chroma coming from Eclipse F20. So that is some of their entry-level speakers. So I think any of those are going to be a, a pretty nice upgrade to the uh, F20s. We'll upgrade to a three-channel amp. So if he's adding a three-channel amp, any recommendations? Kef, Arndall, Focal? I would I'm going to keep my mouth shut because this is where we get branded as some sort of elitist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. In your opinion, your personal opinion, which direction would you go? See, which I can't, do you like the most? I can't comment on any of that because I haven't heard the 1961s. I haven't heard the Kefs and I haven't heard the Focals. So it's hard for me to, I don't ever try to make a recommendation on stuff I physically have not heard and preferably heard even in my own home. And compared directly is the... Uh -huh. I, I guess that's true. Ultimate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Michael, I would just encourage you to listen to them. Um, from experience, Kef and Arundel are going to be pretty neutral. Focal. That'd be a little bit brighter, right? More forward. I don't know. I, <laughs> I typically think they sound brighter to me, but that's what I, most people have, have shared. They're like, Hey, I've, I like it, but it's a brighter sound. You got to go listen to them. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not necessarily that speaker, listen right. to a Kef Uniku driver, sure. listen to an Arundel, listen to a Focal. Yeah. Maybe, hopefully in the same price range as what the speaker mm -hmm. is that you're maybe considering yeah. um, and see what you like. 
Don, appreciate the $5 super chat. I'll be actually on his and uh, Ike's. Uh, let's see. I'll be on their podcast on, on the 11th of January. So that's this Thursday. So I'll be hanging out with those folks. So I appreciate the love, man. So I don't know who that is. You said Don. Is that Don Dunn from Audioholic stuff or is that someone No, else? this is Don Hensley. Um, he has been a follower of mine for a long, long time. He has a channel called Horizon Home Theater. And then Ike is from Easy HT Tech. And so he has a home theater channel as well. And Don is a, uh, he's a dealer integrator um, as well. All right, cool. So I got through all the super chats. So let's go back up. Did you find that question, Ryan? Yeah, I did. Okay. You want to put that up? Oh, down here at the bottom. Here we go. Cool. I found it. Zach says one of the DIY sound group theater tours. The owner mentioned that it's a little more involved mixing sealed and ported subs. So yeah, it's a great question. Um, I haven't done it personally. I've just gone by what other people that have implemented it. I know Ryan, you've done mixed, sealed, and ported in your room and calibrated do that. Tell us that experience. Don't do it. It can be done. Just don't do it. It's just a pain in the butt, right? There's, <laughs> there's so many different problems that you can run into. Mm -hmm. If you can avoid it, avoid it. Yeah. You run into phasing problems at different frequencies, and it's just a nightmare. Yeah. So don't do it. Okay. It's the best thing that I can say. I have a I have a easy button for that. Right. <clears throat> Perhaps. Yeah. I'm not technical enough to understand all those phase interactions that happen between sealed and ported that we know is a problem and right. why it's generally not recommended. But the mic twenty two hundred from Behringer, if you need a high pass filter, that's the magic button. Whatever slope, whatever order they're using. I don't even pretend to remember. I'd have to look it up to remember, but that one works. So you need a high pass filter. The reason they don't work is because the, the roll off slope from a, you're changing yeah. the phase on the, on the ported sub, you're changing the phase of the subwoofer. When you apply a high pass filter, okay. you have to apply the right high pass filter <clears throat> in order to make this work between sealed and ported and the oh. Behringer mic 2200. If you use that as a high pass filter, it will work. From personal okay. experience, I lucked into that. I didn't know it. And so I was reading on the forums for all these years, like, you can't do it. It's real hard. It's impossible yeah. to do. I was like, I didn't have any problem. It just worked. And mm. and through just, like, trying to look into a little bit more, that that one works. Yeah. But if you go into, like, mini DSP and you're just randomly setting high-pass filters, you're going to you're gonna have obstacles. You're going to have you're gonna have problems to try to figure out. So Interesting. There's a guy on the forums named LTD02 who spoke to this on AVS forums and gives you the right order filter and named filter that you need to make them integrate. It's, it's, it's pretty technical, right? Mm -hmm. But the mic 2200 just does it. So it's, it's easy. Yeah, and that's a hundred dollar device. Aren't you just kind of making assumptions though, that your the subs are similar with a standard ported sub. If you're doing horn subs and it's anyone's guess, things might change, you know, no, but no, no, I mean, that the it's like a ported, different brand pointed ported subs have different capabilities. Because if they do, oh, you're gonna run into if, problems. Yeah, I mean, if you're Mick, absolutely, I, and I and I, I should frame it because I'm thinking probably different than the audience is. When I'm thinking ported subwoofer, I'm thinking like totally do it yourself. You got your own cabinet, you're applying your own amp, you're doing all the stuff yourself. If you're buying an off the shelf retail yeah, commercial yeah. ported sub, you don't know what the vendor put in there, and you can't change it anyway. Yeah. So that's gonna be much much harder. So yeah, that's. I, I think the typical. Oh, I think the typical consumer, maybe they would ask that question because maybe they bought a sealed subwoofer and maybe they've mm -hmm. heard, oh man, ported will give me more output at certain frequencies. And so I want to add that to my system. Or maybe they found a good youth man deal on something that's the opposite of what they have. And so it's probably going to be a store-bought, mm -hmm. pre-built subwoofer. Well, and then complicate that with the inexpensive sealed suffer subwoofer will oftentimes have HPF anyway and built into the amp to help protect that driver as well for inexpensive side. So now you're yeah. mixing multiples and you may not even know it with the sealed. So that yeah. that further complicates it. Yeah. Man, there's yeah, a all lot right, good call out. tonight. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just Ryan's on the same wavelength here. Yeah. Okay. So Zach did give us some clarification. Appreciate the additional information, Zach. 
building 18 inch Ultimax and then found two 21 inch Kraken. So this would fall in Jonathan to what you were saying. He's building his mm -hmm. own subs so he can do mm -hmm. all He's of pretty his minority, If you, if you control it from front to end, then a hundred dollar Mike 2200 mm -hmm. makes this not a problem. Okay. So it's a, it's a Mike 200. I don't even know if it's still a, pro a current model, but Behringer mm -hmm. MIC 2200. Let me look it up. Behringer okay. MIC 2200. See if that still exists. Might be a, a help for Zach. No, they went up since my. <laughs> but back in the day, sell. they were hundred dollars. Now they're one hundred and seventy dollars. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, COVID. Whatever else. Everything's expensive. But you found it. Yes, it's still out there. I didn't Go pull ahead. it up. If you don't mind, drop it or at least show yeah, it. Or I can show it. Share. Sure. Okay. Present. Share screen. Zach says appreciate it. Okay, so do you see my screen here? Yeah, if you can click on the we'll, link. We'll go to like Sweetwater here. There we go. So okay. it's like a real simple thing. device. It's just two channels mm -hmm. and allows you to do high pass filter, low pass filter, and some just real simple EQ. Mm -hmm. And the, and what we're interested in is the high pass filter uh, has the right slope and mm -hmm. filter style to co combine with sealed okay. If you're sure. if you're fully doing do it yourself, okay. so on the back of this thing, if I can get to a picture of the back, uh, do they not have a picture of the back? Yeah, yeah it's just using TRS connectors. There's an input and an output. Oh, and it does have XLR. I forgot about that. You can it can barely make it out on my screen, but there's XLR as well. So you know you feed it in from your amplifier, your processor, and you feed it out to your amplifier. This just sits in the middle of your of your yeah. system there. Is that an analog or digital? It's analog. Okay. This is an old school one. Yeah. In fact, it even has a little vacuum tube in it, so they oh, may wow. be tailoring the sound to some degree as well. But that mm -hmm. this was my first foray into like my big ported JTR Passive Pro mm -hmm. Captivator subs that were like the for Pro Audio stuff. This is what I was using from HPF back in 2011, 2012 type time frame, and um, yeah, it just worked. And so I, when I brought sealed in, it just worked. And everyone, I was like, "What's all this? What's all this hubbub about? It just works." Mm -hmm. I didn't know any better. Sweet. That's why it worked. That so Behringer knew, knew to figure it out. Like... Yep. Oh, he says, thank you. Solim, appreciate the $5 super chat. How much delay does SVS wireless transmitters affect with mini DSP calibration? So he's talking about the, the ability SVS sells a little transmitter that allows your subwoofer not to have a, a cable going to it. So you don't have the XLR or an RCA cable. So I looked into that at one point. It's average. They they say actually they advertise that. Uh, I, if I guess, it, I mean I've read it. I just don't remember it. Let's look it up. It's pretty minimal, right? I think it's like twenty five milliseconds. SBS um, wireless delay. It says it says. Oh, here's a review. Um, Less than twenty five point five per five milliseconds. What this is saying. So ASR says it has four point six milliseconds in their review. Well, then that and they measured it. Well, from twenty five. Oh. Uh, That is a long way off. SVS is advertising 25? It's it's in one of the forums on AV Nirvana. Where does ASR say four? Uh, in the review, in the first graph, 4.6 millisecond latency. It's measured on a scope. He says the performance is disappointing in text. What's he hmm. say at the bottom here? This one, yeah, but he had them two feet apart. That delay is probably going to increase with distance on this one here. That would so be my guess. That, yeah, so I, I kind of, I will say this it feels like it feels like these kind of things are kind of like a last ditch, you can't do anything else type yeah. fix because I. I was looking at doing these at some point, so I didn't have to run things under the carpet. And everything wow. I read at the time was talking about you're going to get 
occasional cutouts. Things mm-hmm. are going to go to sleep. Just like anything wireless, it may not be real reliable. You get a little latency. Sometimes they introduce distortion or whatnot. Like the, you're better off running a cable if you can. Yeah. So one difficulty, let's say you have a home that has just all hardwood floors or tile. Definitely makes it much more complicated to be able to, to run a cable around the perimeter of your home if you can't hide it. Mm-hmm. Kind of looks weird going around your door frame, you know. I think Outlaw makes one. Mm-hmm. Monoprice has one. SVS has one, if I remember right. I wouldn't be surprised if they're all the same. That could be. Mm. Effectively, don't use them unless you have to. Spliffy Bendrix, appreciate the follow super chat. Ryan, are you still a dealer for Buckeye? Need a three channel amp. I'm not sure between a purifier or four channel in core uh, and just leave an empty channel. Thoughts? Encore and Purify is going to be dictated based on what you're trying to use them for. Encore is really good. Purify can just handle more loads and is going to be better distortion coefficient. So I would, it's depends on what you need. I need a Purify for my Martin Logans. Mm-hmm. Um, the Purifies technically have a better noise floor. So if you've got an ultra sensitive speaker, that can be beneficial. But send me an email. I mean, we can talk about it and we can see if what makes the most sense for you. And I can either sell you one or you can go directly Mm -hmm. through Dylan. All right, back on up here. Dave says, will a Stark SW15 work as a near-filled subwoofer? Yes. I wouldn't see why not. It's a sealed subwoofer, 15-inch. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you can get it close enough to your body, right? Because mm-hmm. you're talking about making sure that that's 15 inches or less from you. Correct. Ideally. So that's, it just makes it harder the smaller that subwoofer. But yeah, so technically, I don't see any issues there. Michael Lotta says, no way I would listen at reference volume. We value our hearing. We listen more like 60 dB. Michael needs to drink his V8. <laughs> wow. Called the brother out, man. Wow. Yeah. 60 dB. That's quiet. Yeah. I would talk louder than that when I'm sitting here talking to myself. What's going mm-hmm. on with that? Yeah. Yeah. He just measured it a minute ago. It was 75 dB. At normal volume talking. Yeah, I'm talking right now and I'm 71, 72. You listen at 60? You like talk, you just listen like this. That's how he likes watching the movies. It's just whispering. <laughs> but again, I mean, it's his home theater. He can listen to it at uh-huh. whatever volume. So if right, you enjoy it, enough. then that's great. If you invite me over, I may not come we'll back. Turn it up. We're we'll turning it up. The volume is very subjective. Yeah. I'll say that. You know, everybody's going to want something different. So, mm-hmm. Michael, you like it at 60? I do not. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody is. Yeah. Have fun, man. The important should thing, be happy in their subjective environment. Why are you shouting, Jonathan? <laughs> Love it. Michael, appreciate the vote for M-Wave 24. We're really excited for it as well. Um, I'm not starting anymore. Mazen says, yeah, as he just started another one. Mazen well, says, that- does it? Is it worth to replace a nine channel AVR to 11 channel just for the additional surround back? So maybe going from a 5.2.4 to a 7.2.4 AVR. So the surround backs make that much of a difference in a setup. I'm still the mindset. And we've talked about this before on several shows. I, I personally would do seven bed layers over four ceiling layers. That's, a subjective call. I don't think Michael agrees with me, but that's my preference. That's what I would so, do. Wait, what do you mean now? I, if you were limited, when he says 5.2.4, right. if he's limited to nine channels, I would choose 7.2.2 over 5.2.4. Oh, it see. is current limitation. Yeah. So to me, saying. I would say seven bed channels is more important than four okay. heights. That's that's yeah, my yeah. take. I would differ than that. I just I wanted agree. to clarify. I mean, I know you differ on that. Yeah. That's just... 
I think it's, I think there's a lot of content that's mixed with seven channel speakers. It was like that for two decades, you know, yeah. or, or whatnot, where that was the, the standard. Sure. That might be an exaggeration on time, but it was a long time that we had seven channels as a standard. So you're missing maybe, that. So maybe, it, all right. So part of that may come from me and my room because my rear surrounds are not set up the best location they had to be mounted above my door frame mm -hmm. and now they're angled down they're right at my listening position but they're much farther distance i know we can you know eq that we've level matched it but for some reason i'm not so sure that i would really notice them like drastically if they were gone mm -hmm. you know um and in the past i've used wide dispersion speakers for my side surround so i think that was probably an issue there too because the sounds all kind of mushed, you know, out into the room dispersion wise. But so, even with my JTRs, they're very directional. I'm I'm just not sure that to me again, I, I would rather have four at most than than seven bed layers if I had to choose. This is a good question that gets brought up. Depends on your seating. If your seats are against the back wall, then rear surrounds don't work very well. Yeah. But That's I mean mine true. aren't. I mean, I'm just talking about my front no, row. I'm I'm yeah. saying for the variable of the question sure. that was asked yeah there are variables that come up with the room and if yeah. the room is not conducive to seven bed layer then yeah. don't do it but if you have enough room behind the main listening position or the main row then apps i would say seven bed layer mm -hmm. jonathan says seven bed layer mm -hmm. and sheldon says i've done before. some um that's not some right blind tests in your room 5.1.4 to 7.1 he's talking about our 2014 auto eq meet it wasn't it was 5.1.2 to okay. 7. nothing so it was mm -hmm. it was introducing the onkyo okay whatever it was the very first onkyo the cheapest budget entry that had uh dolby atmos yeah. and it could only do two ceiling speakers okay. uh, and the other ones were if they did it at all they were up mixing it to the ceiling speakers and so it was a it wasn't four speakers that we were doing in that test I mean, Nicholas also brings up a good point that generally, if you can't fit rears, you can't fit four ceilings. That's fair. I'm going to go back to this comment that I missed that makes me laugh. What's that? And this is in this is in regards to the gentleman who said he listens to 60 dB and no louder. <laughs> cash. Oh my goodness, <laughs> man! I love it. I love it. Um, real quick yeah give a shout out to my daughter natalie watching the entire podcast hey natalie appreciate you hanging out with us tonight with dad that's super cool man No, and Sheldon, the reason I know that that's the case is because at that time I only had those in-wall Sony speakers that were my ceiling speakers. I didn't even have like the extra Mackies up there. So I'm just reading the comments. Sorry, I'm talking aloud to Sheldon saying that's yeah, memory yeah. might be wrong. All right, Bruce says, uh, you guys saying that makes me feel like something wrong with me. Negative 10 feels like it's barely on. Wonder if it was Bruce former military or, you know, some, some of the, I mean, just honestly, some of the guys over our experience with this stuff, guys that have had loud jobs and so forth in the path, they'll crank on that thing. Reminds me of the Simpsons THX intro for movies. Turn it up. What? <laughs> <laughs> James says, how do you feel or how do you find reference level on your AVR? So we kind of address that. that. Yeah. That's got to be an old question. Hopefully it, they are. I mean, that was asked when we virtually first started the stream. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So I'm going to unstar that one. Yeah, a lot of these are dealing with reference that we talked about. I think Bruce asked, asked a good question here, though. Okay. Would reference with speakers that can't handle reference cause damage? Hmm, interesting. To your ears or to the speakers? I would think speakers is maybe what he's asking. Oh, it can damage I'm assuming. Speakers. Yes. Can it damage your ears? I don't know the answer to that, actually. Is it technically worse for your ears or just more annoying? To listen to it if the speaker's distorting it. Oh, level. you mean if it's distorting and if it's actually not that loud? I don't see that's gonna. I don't have an answer to oh, that. Bruce I would say no, but no. I see. I was wrong. I assume my bad, Bruce. Thanks for correcting me. He says um, he's a mechanic, and he says his, his question is ears. 
would reference with speakers that can't handle re- cause damage yeah. to your ears. I don't know. Anybody don't an audiologist? That's actually right. a great question. Can certain well, the thing, boundary- they can't they can't reach reference anyway. I know, but the, if it's the distortion is hurting your ears, like it you wince because the distortion, right? Mm-hmm. Does that actually hurt your ears or is it just yeah. annoying and uncomfortable? Yeah. I don't know. I don't have <laughs> I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. Aaron says I would assume volume is volume, which that, that would be me too. I don't know. I don't think distortion is going to impact your hearing, but again, I'm not an audiologist either. But good question. Bruce, uh, different Bruce says, what is the benefit of having two center channel speakers, which Sony receivers offer this option or wh- he's asking a question, which Sony receivers offer this option? Cause that's kind of a new feature that they've added. I'm of the mindset I don't think adding two center channels is beneficial. If you're not, I mean, the only time I could ever see having two center channels and that's if you could get them to play nice together and sound good and you don't have comb filtering and all that stuff is if you have just a massive TV and you have no place to put a center channel. They actually do this, you know, above and below Mm -hmm. and you're trying to get that to image in the middle. So that sounds like it's coming from the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what they're trying to do. How well that works, I don't know. Um, so have y'all had a chance to hear that? Not with the Sony ones, but I've heard dual channels, top and bottom, multiple times. And had you it like it or no? Or? I liked it. You liked it? Okay, interesting. I like it. I mean, it. The comb filtering doesn't bother me. I can't hear it if it's integrated. It's overblown concern on that. Yeah. What's that? Comb filtering concerns with that are overblown. Hmm, Every room I've been in with the, like if you have a solid screen, it's not AT and your speakers are not behind the screen Correct. and you just split the signal between top and bottom screen. Okay. It's it, on a, on a microphone, on my Omni mic. I measured oh. a friend of mine's room, Randy, who does this with his theater and it looks terrible. I mean, you got like, like right. huge comb filtering. Sure. You don't hear it. And, mm-hmm. and not only do you not hear it, Multiple people in the 2015 our, our home theater crawl that we did said his room had some of the best center channel sound of anybody, okay. and it measured like crud. <laughs> the, there's another thing where mics see and hear different than we with our ears yeah. do. Okay. So one question I have with that is, let's say you only have an AVR. Is it advisable? To, I would think it would not be advisable to hook two center channels up to your center channel output on an AVR. No. Is that correct or is that an incorrect assumption? Can it handle four ohms? Because most of the time you'd be knocking your eight ohm speaker to four ohms. Correct. If you're a, can your AVR handle four ohms? So it's going to have trouble or not? I mean, most yeah, but you'd also be, be having problems if the distance is worth the same. You'd be creating problems with that too because you wouldn't be able to compensate for two different distances using okay. one output. Sort of depends on how low the bottom is, right? Because it can. It could be pretty close. It could to the same distance. Is yeah, your speaker wire. No, no, just the speaker. All oh, the to distances you. in the I, I, distance right, right, from yeah. the top and bottom speaker to your ear. Okay, I, I'm following. So I didn't have anything fancy, and in, in my own experience in doing a top and bottom center channel, I think it was probably probably just related to the fact that I didn't have to drive either speaker as hard. But I had, I didn't, I was just using regular receiver and I did a top wharf dale and a bottom wharf dale above and below the screen. And my, it was better for it. I could, the dialogue didn't get as cruddy as fast as as you turn the volume up. Hmm. I I didn't even have measuring gear at that point when I was doing that. I was just experimenting and liked it better. My question, because we do a lot of AB testing with this, is if you put that right next to a setup that wasn't doing that, would there be an audible difference? Yeah, that's like, a good would question. we then d- decide if mm-hmm. this actually yeah. sounds like crap? Right. And are we subjectively deciding that this doesn't because we don't have a frame of reference to compare mm-hmm. it to? Just so playing Justin, devil's advocate. I don't know. Yeah, I, it's says, fair. It's fair. Logically, he thinks that it would be similar to a stereo image, just vertical. Instead of having a left and a yes. right, you're doing a top and a bottom. So, so long as your ear is basically in the middle of those two speakers, top and bottom, it should do exactly that. Okay. So what about your off axis? What about your seat to the left, your seat to the right? Top and bottom wouldn't change the left to right. Mm -mm. So it'd still be the same because they're same, roughly the same distance. If you were listening on a bunk bed, it might affect the top bunk. Technically, it's bad. (laughs) Subjectively, 
Jonathan likes like it. it. So right. I'll throw Fair my enough. name out there. You like no, it too. I like it too, but I uh -huh. I don't have a direct comparison to say does it actually sound like crap or not i don't know it sounded okay, so fine when i used it so back to his question though we kind of got off track but what's the benefit then if it's acceptable to have it imaging what benefit are you gaining it from brings the image into off? the screen instead of it being below exactly so is it fair to say that unless you have a really or a pretty good size screen that that wouldn't really matter if you got a 55 inch tv should you really worry about two Center does channel. it sound like it sounds coming from below your TV? If it does, this might solve that, help you. 55 inch, I just don't think you're going to notice that much difference. So maybe, I don't know. The It should, right? Those Sony receivers should have independent time delays on that too. You would think that it's doing that. I don't know. I haven't read up on it. You would think so. Yeah, let I'm us know in the chat do. if you have a Sony. I think it's on the newer Sonys. If you've got one. Or if you know about it, do they have the independent time delay? Just be curious. So let us know in the chat. Percy uh, says, what processor would you recommend in the $3,500 range? Man, I mean, that's a great question. Processor. I've been super pleased with my Marantz AV7706. Um, that would easily fit in that seventy or $3,500 range. So what are your options there? You got the 7706. You've got... The 8805, 8805, the AVM70, mm -hmm. AVM70, okay. Uh, the HDP1. You can do 3800 even, and it'll turn it in a preamp mode, or the 4800, or the 6800, for that matter, all those. Because they have yeah. a full full dedicated preprocessor mode, which gives well, fine the benefits to the 6800 is you can actually turn off the amps. You do that on all of them, I think. Or sorry, you can the sixty eight hundred. You can turn off selective amps, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. They have a new function mm -hmm. where you can turn off some of them, and not all of them. Uh, I think um, the HTB one is a little bit more out of the budget. It's four thousand mm dollars. -hmm. But Black Friday sales and stuff come around every once in a while, and they'll drop off that five hundred bucks. So that could be an option, possibly. More used, be stock. Yeah. So, and honestly, all of those that we mentioned are, are solid AVRs and processors. So I reviewed the HTB one. Fantastic. I own the 7706 rock solid. I've never had a single issue with it. If you ever. guys were going to buy an AVR or pre in that price range, what would you buy? I'd do the Denon 6800. And what's Morant's equivalent to that? I mean, that'd be fine too. From my perspective, I would imagine it'd be the new oh. Cinema series. The f what, what is it though? Is it the forty? I don't know. I don't know what the equivalent would be. Aaron says eighty five hundred. I don't think I would do the eighty five hundred because the eighty five hundred doesn't support direct. Mm. I mean, Carp if you sixty eight hundred for me, yeah, I think I'd go sixty eight hundred. I think there's some good options, Percy. Definitely look at the feature set too. You know, see what options, because to some people, things like Oro 3D is a big deal to them. Some of them, it isn't. Um, some people, the big deal is the process or the uh, room correction software, whether it's Dirac, Odyssey, um, their own proprietary well, software. Well, people are bringing up a good point, too, that the 6800 has Two four sub outs. Sub -outs. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and and every single bell and whistle. There is not, yeah. besides auto EQ of your preference, that might be room EQ or whatever else. Mm -hmm. There is it's really nothing on today's modern market with as regards to codecs or anything. Yeah. Whereas the HTTP one from Monoprice, HTTP one, it doesn't have DTSX Pro yet, right? No. So you aren't getting more than 11 channels of processing for that. Not that there's very many DTSX movies, if we're being quite frank, but you're not getting your full 15 channels yeah. without DTSX Pro. What's a used, what's a used storm or used trend off? Can, or anything in that realm, or is it is it just still too high for that ballpark it's price? Too high rate? for that. Yeah. 
I what mean, about some of the fancier boutique stuff like Lindorf or whatnot that Bob likes, for instance? I don't Lindorf. know what the Lindorfs are going to be. I think the Lindorfs are like 12 grand initially. So you're still probably looking, even at 50% off MSRP, that's still six grand. So that's still way above that. The AVM 70 and 90 get a lot of love from people. Mm -hmm. I haven't used one personally, but yes. they get a lot of love. One day I'll get the 70 hooked up. Just saying. And that Yamaha, there's diehard, diehard Yamaha guys mm -hmm. on the forums sure. for sure. Yeah. And they and they have a really good reliability track record, to be quite yeah. honest. The Yamahas do. Yeah. Chris says, do wall treatments affect any reference level settings? Yeah, they 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 affect what you hear, but not so much what you measure. Think about a measurement being when you do a frequency response capture or an impulse response or an SPL meter, it's the loudest sound that's getting to that microphone. There's other sounds. There's other reflection points that are coming in, second order, third order reflections, things that are hitting other walls and bouncing back. But those are all underneath the highest reflection. So from an SPL meter thing, whether you have treatments on that second reflection point or the first reflection point, it's not, it's not going to affect probably the out, output of the highest that's the direct wave from the speaker itself. But it will affect what you hear very much so and how much maybe you like what you hear potentially mm -hmm. if you have a bare drywall yeah. and it's three foot away when you cover it with treatment or don't it's going to sound different yeah oh very much so it's fun and walking into my room while it's under construction and listening to the sound change so think about this too so at reference think about this you're increasing volume if you have a room that's bare with no acoustic treatment, really, if you're listening to it at moderate volume or kind of low volume, your speakers may sound good. I would think the louder you play it, the worse it's going to sound in your room because there's more reflections and more bouncing around and more um, frequencies colliding together. Is that a safe assumption? Subjective safe assumption. There's some subjectivity Subjective. there, right? Because that, that is, it creates a live sound. Some people like a live sound. Okay. But generally speaking, subject, I agree with you. I would just say that would be so degree. much like I've been in bare rooms. Well, mm -hmm. back up to my initial room, probably the first several years, I didn't have any acoustic treatment in there. Didn't know any better. I actually thought acoustic panels were snake oil. I really did. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's stupid. Why would you put pieces of foam on your wall or, you mm -hmm. know, this insulation on your wall? That's dumb. You're just trying to get my money. And up until that point, I always struggled with my center channel. It just didn't sound clear. Mm -hmm. And I was the guy that, you know, was boosting my center channel thinking, okay, I just need more volume. It's just not loud enough. So I'd boost it three or four dB and it kind of helped, but it still wasn't clear. And it wasn't until... I added acoustic treatment that my sound cleaned up considerably. At least I felt that way. And so that's where that's coming from is if I were to crank it even louder in a room that does not have acoustic treatment, it would just make that even more muddy and, you know, harder to hear. So but maybe if you like that live sound and hey, go for it. It's your room. Bruce says, question, how do you calibrate an SPL meter? We okay, we talked about that one. Uh, okay. Power conditioner, uh, Saskalant says, which power conditioner should I get? Panamax 5400 or the Furman PL Pro DMC 20 amp or no power conditioner at all? What's the PL Pro? I'm looking that one up. Furman? Furman's pretty reputable brand. brand. Furman Panamax. PL 50? They're the Pro. same company. Yes. Are they? Yeah. Furman Umbrella. and... Interesting. I did not know that. Did you find it, Jonathan? Yeah, but what I'm trying to figure out is like the 5400 from Panamax, that one's actually doing like active line conditioning. Yes. And I'm and what I'm trying to figure out is if this other one is doing that. Okay. Because there's a there's a difference there. What's the DMC 20 amp? Is that part of that model number, the Furman, or yeah, that's a different brand. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was a different brand. 
I don't think it's, I don't think it's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's doing the active line level conditioning that the Panamax is doing. Mm -hmm. So what I'm specifically talking about is the voltage regulation function. Okay. Um, like the Panamax is making a perfect sine wave out of your voltage. Like it's kind of doing what a active online UPS does. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has its own benefit and just providing a real clean power to your equipment. Is any mm -hmm. of this audible? Probably not. Okay. They can if fix you... ground loops and stuff though. Yeah. But don't think of it as like a like in car audio back in the days when you used to have like a one fraud cap or two fraud cap and your headlights wouldn't dim and your bass would be better. It's not mm -hmm. doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's just making sure that your power is clean and pure that's going to your equipment. It might add to the longevity. It's kind of like once you've done everything else, you might consider that. I don't know that I'd start with that. I think of them more or buy them more for power distribution it's typically turning on and off things and mm -hmm. order synchronized power mm -hmm. ons and stuff. I I've told this before and I, and I have one purposely because I have a story that, that makes me think they're necessary. I was in my basement in the old house watching a movie and lightning was storm was going on outside. Lightning struck all my equipment turned off. Mm -hmm. It came back on pretty much immediately, like within a few seconds. I looked over at my rack when it all turned off and I was like, well, that stinks. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that it fired back on when my rack, when that, when I was looking over there and my voltage on my monster power, HTS 50, whatever it was came back on and it was beeping and clicking and making all kinds of sounds. And it said something like, and I have to look up the, I wrote it down a post at one point, 330 volts or something like that. So my 110 shot through a tremendous amount of voltage and it fried that monster power unit. I'd rather it fry my, nothing else died. I'd rather it fry my monster power unit than fry my equipment. Yeah, so, but you're looking there too at surge protection and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think they have their places. Power conditioners to a certain extent can fix mm -hmm. certain things. Surge protection can fix certain things yeah. and distribution can help with certain things. This is not us saying that you're going to have an audible. It's going to magically make your sound better. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about. It's more of if you've got a ground loop or you have some problem in your power that is documentable and demonstrable, mm -hmm. these certain ones can help fix it. It's not that you're going to magically hear more low end or more mid range or high end or things are going to be like butter smooth or crunchiness is going to go away. <laughs> But uh, you'll read that stuff on the forums. That's the weird part, yeah. right? You yeah. will read that. No I bought claim this. Your sound has never been better. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like this one. Looks better than plugging twenty things into an outlet with adapters like Clark Griswold. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. true. That is true. And so here's another. Um, so Justin says, you know, he likes his because he lives in the middle of the sticks, so he's out in the boonies, um, and he gets brownouts all the time. And so that is a major concern. Yeah, brownouts are more damaging than than like complete pull of a power because now your power voltage is fluctuating. So it's kind of, you know, you're, you're cranking a movie and watching it at reference volume. And all of a sudden your receiver doesn't cut off. It just kind of dips down in power. No telling what that's doing to the internal, um, you know, components. So that's not a good idea. Um, I have Gary another story on that UPS. thing that I think is worthwhile. Um, mm -hmm. And I've told this one on the podcast before too, but it's relevant to what discussion. Now I have that Panama Panamax and we yeah. had a problem with our power in our neighborhood. The, mm -hmm. the, the power was drifting between like 85 volts and 130 volts, like over and over again. It was just cycling. There was some sort of ground problem in the system. And yeah. my Panamax was what alerted me. There was a problem. The Panamax was beeping and making all kinds of noises and tell me something was wrong. I called the power company. My amplifiers were not connected to the Pan Panamax because there's, too many and it's not rated okay. for that kind of power pull one of my amplifiers died but everything behind the panamox didn't die mm -hmm. would it have died if it wasn't i don't know but it, it multiple things there right it was protecting my equipment a and b it alerted me there was a problem i didn't know i had otherwise yeah power company came out and fixed it yep yeah 
Cody Greer, he says, I'm wondering if you three ever find yourselves not enjoying movies because you're listening to inconsistencies in your system. Yes. I find myself doing this every so often. So elaborate on that. So you've listened, you've stopped enjoying movies because of inconsistencies in your system. What does that mean? Well, that's one reason why I don't go to theaters. I don't like my experience being dictated by others. Um, mm -hmm. I don't because every time I go to a theater, mm -hmm. right? I always identify some shortcoming and it bothers me. Yeah, but you're you're off topic. He says in your system. I, I, I get that. I'm using that <laughs> as an example. And then I come back to my system right. and if something's wrong, like mm -hmm. my wife hates it because I'll be, I use my system a lot for testing and troubleshooting and stuff for other companies. And if I forget something or change something and I can't look past that yeah. and it bothers me and my wife's like, what is wrong with you? Mm. And I'm like, I have to fix this. And then she'll just get up and leave. So yeah. it's, it's, it's hard for me because I know what it should be and can be. And if it's not doing that, then mm -hmm. it bothers me. But if it's all behaving, mm -hmm. I don't know that any type of, okay. I don't know that I would have any inconsistencies if mm -hmm. I haven't mucked with it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't stop watching movies because like Ryan said, I mean, if it's inconsistent, it's because it's something I did, I changed the setting in it and I know mm -hmm. how to change it back. So. I don't think my system's inconsistent. Um, it's either consistently sounding good or consistently not working right. And that's my fault, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Jonathan. Mike Love. Oh, I, sorry, I, I, no, I mean, I think that there's probably truth that in a lot of ways, as you dig deeper in the hobby and you learn more about how things are and like, mm -hmm. you're messing with this slider, or that slider to like, this might not be, you know, now you learned about HDR. Well, how does it look with HDR slider one and versus four? Mm -hmm. You know, you just, you play with stuff a little bit more. That yeah. doesn't prevent me from stop enjoying movies. I still love the hobby and still, you know, but, yeah. but it, there's things that cross your mind. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. I just don't think it has hindered me from watching movies. I, I enjoy movies. White glove review says, Hey guys, I have a 7.1.2 50, 50 UB projector. It's got the U4700 from Denon, clip speakers and a sub. The end goal, 7.2.4. So he wants to add an additional sub and an additional pair of Atmos with a less than $1,000 budget. Should he get two more speakers, like in-ceiling speakers? Should he get an amp, maybe an Emotiva Basics 3 channel for the front? Or get the UM1822 DIY and amp? I know what I'd go for. I know what I would do. Jonathan? You know what you would do? No, my my mind went down a rabbit trail. Let me catch up. Oh, oh bad. Well, it's so, related to this question, but it's a rabbit trail. I'm not sure I want to bring it up or not. I will. Go ahead. You guys answer, and I'll bring up my rabbit trail. I'm telling so, you, I, doing the UM1822, yeah, that you're going to get so much more value and benefit out of that massive upgrade than adding an amplifier. I mean, that'll be pretty minimal. If anything, um, adding two speakers, I like having two speakers, but again, dude, when you hit some serious power, some serious SPL, some serious low frequencies, that's pretty life changing to me in a home theater. Jonathan. Do I, this might be a deeper project product that I, or a topic that I want to broach right now, but the UM1822 specs have changed mm -hmm. silently okay. along the way by Parts Express. And there's a thread on AVS forum that's exploring it. It's really disappointing. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes. Oh. So, what changed? Let me see if I if I can if I can package this up nicely enough to discuss it right now. Okay. Stand by just a second. Go ahead, Ryan, and then I'll come back to me if I can find a good thread on it here. And even if it's not particularly the UM1822, having a, and I don't, is that an 18-inch subwoofer? Yeah, What's yeah the that's the one I have. What's the 22 in reference to? Uh, just the model number. It's UM1822. They have UM1522, UM1222. It's just, it's just whatever they okay. named that thing. Yeah, but in general, 18 inch subwoofer, man, that would be much bigger impact typically in the system than adding two Atmos, 
or adding an amplifier. Oh, unless your speakers are just really, really needing power desperately, but that basics isn't going to to make a massive difference. Let, let me share this, and I and I hesitate to share this in some ways because I don't want to disparage something that I haven't measured individually. But there's guys on the forums that have pointed this out, and Parts Express did it themselves. So mm -hmm. boo to them. Present mm -hmm. share screen one oh, second. I think Here we comes. should state that we had. Yeah, we haven't tested none, this. None of the three of us have verified this. No. Well, so the guys on AVS Forum have. No, but us example, three have not. Now, AVS correct. may have, but. And, and Parts Express has different parameters up on their website secretly changed. And here's here's an example of it. This Can is you a, zoom in here? Yeah. This is a PM conversation with somebody asking me about the, the, the stuff we're talking about. Uh, or we're conversating about this kind of thing. So. Here's this is a UM1522. So this is the little brother to mine. Instead of an 18, it's 15. Mm -hmm. This is the 2021. This is using the Wayback Machine Parts Express web page on the specifications for the driver. And mm -hmm. this is the frequency response. Uh, I can't really read this. This is 50, 40, 30, 20. So you can see 20, it's kind of blurry, even on mine on the source. It's probably really blurry for you guys. But basically, this left line is 20, and this is 100 hertz. And then it's going way higher for some reason. This is one kilohertz. This is the frequency response of the one of the 15 inch driver of my variety back in 2021, the specs. Mm -hmm. okay. You can see it's pretty flat between 100 hertz and 20 hertz. Like it's in, they were, the Dayton Ultimax were really nice drivers, truly. Okay. Now, this is today's, this is today's little thing that's mm -hmm. not, wow. Look at that. Here's 20 hertz, here's 100 hertz. So this is the same range. Right. Now we've dropped off. We lost tons of output in the we, lower frequencies. Now, now to be fair, well this line isn't fair. This is this is ten. This is twenty. But it's still not yeah. the same driver. Right. This this is different. It, it's not the same driver. They kept the name. They changed the specs on the driver. Interesting. So that's a little disappointing. Right. Make sure you know that when you go in there. I, I don't know that it's a. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a bad driver. It's just not the same driver. So the you just should be aware of that. That's all. Okay. And the same thing happened with, like, this is the 15 we're looking at, but the same thing happened on the 18. And there's a thread on AVS form where people are discussing this. And they're kind of mad at Parts Express for kind of slipping that under the radar without really, like, making it real clear. They changed the page. They just didn't say this is, like, version 2 or something, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. That's all. So you might be getting less performance, but you think you're buying what used to be, like, here's a really good standard. This thing is rock mm -hmm. solid, great performance, pretty linear in the frequency response. Mm -hmm. But this new one, they kind of made some changes. Didn't yes. really tell anybody. Yes. The guys are kind of acting like this is maybe a little bit more like a cost-cutting measure than a than an upgrade. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of the same price. It's the same name, but it doesn't perform quite as well. Uh, they're saying that even the, the yeah. excursion isn't quite as much as it used to be. Like it used to exceed its rated excursion, and now some of the guys are saying it doesn't meet it or it's close to it instead of exceeding it. So it's it's kind of a downer. That's for the dangerous. guys, you know, that yeah. have discovered this. Do I know when the change occurred? I don't know, Zach, but mm -hmm. clearly it occurred between 2021 and now, because if you use a Wayback Machine, there's only yeah. a couple snapshots on these things. Go to Wayback Machine. You might be, I only looked at the 15. Mm -hmm. um, the thread might have more information on it. I haven't read the front thread front to end, yeah. but, but it happened somewhere in the last couple of years. Okay. So Percy, we answered the other question, but uh, we'll just talk about the second part. Jonathan, you plan on doing any more LS12,000 videos? I do have one more I'm planning to do still. Okay. It's It's been delayed forever because I don't have a good way to film it. I'd still like to do it. I'm probably, I'll probably end up just doing a compilation one. I want to do a black level one, but I can't compare it easily because the camera jacks up. Mm. It makes the, if you're trying to do the real dim, dark scenes that the JVC is superior at, yeah. it makes the Epson look so bad on the camera. Like it makes it like fluorescent blue that you can, okay. I can't. I can't show what you really see. Yes, sure. the JV is superior, but it's not like JV or the Epson isn't making itself fluorescent blue in mm -hmm. those scenes, but that's what the camera's picking up. The camera's picking that up. Yeah. So uh, instead, we did an ABS forum shootout. Uh, Chirpy came over, Ryan Kramer came over, and we did it with his nice, fancy camera so we could just do a comparison of pictures of Black Level that show it pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. I, I'm having trouble getting the video on it. So it'll probably just be more of a summary video. And then I got to sell that JVC. I've said that for two years, and here it is. I got to sell it. Oh, wow. Well. The sell the JVC, which one? Our uh, NS NZ7 RS2100. Yeah. 
All right. A couple more questions. Nicholas, good to see you, buddy. Uh, it says when Tony had a Marantz, all this JTR, his JTRs went to negative 12 after Odyssey, but measuring with his U mic to confirm, verify they were all correct at 75 dB. So it basically bottomed out, but it was just enough to meet that 75 dB. So interesting. I, I, I would read that to him. I think Tony and Nick are probably trying to say that it was adjusting it, even though you couldn't see it with the GUI, it was getting it to the right level. But I uh, think that might've been, it, it could be the receiver dependent with my Onkyo 5508 mm -hmm. back in 2011, 2010, 2012 timeframe. I had the JTRs in my room. Maybe it was 2013, 14. I don't remember the exact year in that time frame. 102 dB sensitive, small listening range. They were mm -hmm. way too loud. I had to buy those 10 dB or 12 dB attenuators. And, and with my SPL meter, with my Omni mic at that time, as I was testing with it, I had it. The, it was not, it didn't calibrate it correctly. So to, so if, if Nicholas is suggesting that it calibrated it, like it, it went ahead and did it, even though the GUI didn't show it, mine didn't on the Onkyo 5508, it was too loud and there was no way to turn it down. And that's why I had to get the attenuators. So, so your mileage might vary mm -hmm. based on what receiver you're using or processor you're using, whether it's doing it behind the scenes and can't show it or whether it's just not doing it because it can't do it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. I thought that the Denon Morantz only did a maximum of 12 dB cut. The uh, Onkyo does for sure, because that was what I had at the, as the processor at the time. It, it was showed negative 12 because that was the most it could do. And it was it was too loud. Like it didn't now, it didn't correct it and have 12 showing. It was just couldn't can, correct it. I don't remember what the maximum value you can change it in to the multi EQX Pro mm -hmm. was. I don't remember if you could go past that. You can limit it, but I don't remember if you could go past that. More of the higher end stuff, theoretically, you can go into infinite cut, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know what Den and Morantz can change yeah. to in the multi EQX Pro versions. Maybe somebody. You, in chat you think you could change it beyond what the GUI shows in the multi? I don't know. I don't, I don't know, know either. I don't know if the if the the multi EQX is if it has different parameters than the negative twelve. I probably I should have bought that on the Black Friday sale. It was down to 150 bucks, I think. I have a license for you, Jim. Yeah, hook you up, man. He's offered that several times. Doesn't want Take it. Take him up his offer, man. <laughs> Make some videos on it. Teach people how to use it. Mm -hmm. Tell them if it's worth it. It's right up your alley. Good content. Go subscribe. Hit the like button. Share the video. <laughs> What's Ryan doing over there? I don't know. Oh, uh, he's getting tired, man. It's almost three hours. Uh, Jeffrey said, last couple questions. Jeffrey, what bang for your buck amps would you recommend to power multiple JL subwoofers? Doing a DIY sealed in-wall setup with these. What's the bang power handling on those? What do they even need? And bang for your buck. What does that even mean? 13 so, TW5. 13 TW5. JL audio specs. Those Let's are Let's see. So that's a, a real thin $850 sub. And the specs on that one. You're looking at 600 watts continuous. Um recommended RMS. It's a two ohm subwoofer though. So keep that in mind. So two home, 600 watts continuous. What's he looking at? Budget. So that, I'd, go on, I guess, I'd go on eBay and buy a Crown XLS 402, 802, 602. They're nothing. They cost less than $200, and, they, mm -hmm. and they'll do everything you need it to do. eBay. But then aren't you going to run into a pass filter down low where it's going to... Most of those crowns and pro amps and stuff are gonna not those not those particular models. You're absolutely right on the DSP models, but those don't have DSP. Oh, then you're fine. They're just old school, old yeah. iron amps. What yeah. about the iNukes? I'd do crown over an iNuke. Okay. At, at that budget level, I would too, because uh, like the iNuke one thousand is kind of kind of meager, and the mm -hmm. three thousand you're up to four hundred bucks already, and the six thousand you're up to like seven hundred bucks already. You can do what you need to do with a small power 
requirement with the crown. Like and an MW old makes crown. a suggestion. He says, hey, take a look at the Wisdom 9i sub. So that might be an option as well. Same price. Wisdom. Mm -hmm. Hey, we don't have a problem recommending used on this forum, Tim. Yeah. No. And Tim. No. Save some money, man. It's a good way to go sometimes. All right, last couple. Uh, Ryan, yes, we already did that one. Still a Buckeye dealer. Jeremiah, would the Klipsch LCR Pro 25RW and the reference in-wall and in-ceiling speakers make reference sound using the Anthem MRX 1140? Can he get reference sound from the LCR Pro? I'm not familiar with that. LC Klipsch LCR Pro. What was the other part of that? 25RW? 25 RW. What is that? Okay, so that's like an in wall speaker. I'll share my screen here. And let's take a look at here, brother. These two guys above me are going to say, heck no. Heck no. It's all the 5.25 driver. I say, heck no, right away. Yeah, so small driver. Oh, but there's two of them 93 dB. So we've got dual five and a quarters, one inch aluminum dome tweeter. I'm changing my answer to probably no. Okay. <laughs> without without measuring it from heck no. If it was one driver, heck no. Probably okay. no now. 75 watts continuous. So not a lot of power there that it can handle. We'll just do the rough calculation. You got 95, 93 dB sensitive at one meter. But clips us <laughs> overrating that. You know this. So, okay, I know. So we, we don't know how much. Yeah, I mean, people make it seem like, oh, they're like 20. D no, bull let's crap. just say it's 90. I don't even think it's that much different. Let's let's so say it's 90. Aaron's audio corner said, I think they average four to six on the clips as he's measured over over rating. But I don't know okay. about this model. So let, let's just say 90 and give them the benefit of the doubt. Fair. So mm -hmm. let's say your listening distance is 12, four meters. Mm hmm. Okay, which isn't unreasonable for a lot of people. So now you're I'm three meters is probably more fair. Nine three feet meters is just over nine feet for a surround speaker. Oh, okay. Surround Not speaker, sure. Okay. So you're at three meters. So you're down six dB, then you're down three dB. So we're down nine dB, roughly. So 90. So we're at 81 now we've got to get back to 105 so 91 81 at one watt 84, 84 at two 87 at four 90 at eight 93 at 16 96 at 32 99 at 64 102 at 128, 105 mm. is 256. And that's without EQ. It's, it's... I mean, with gain, like room gain and stuff. It's maybe. on that line. So that's, that's that where you're it did say It did say 300 watts peak. 75 watts continuous. Yeah, but all right. So there's also the aspect where sometimes speakers say that thing, and then I measure the compression sweeps, and that tweeter's like, mm, "That's crap." Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna say probably not, but I don't know. Yeah, because then you, you gotta the then you gotta throw EQ on top of that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I I feel like there's better options, but if you're already in the Cl Clips ecosystem, so is he looking for maybe bigger drivers? Would that help him if he has like? an in wall that has an eight inch driver versus a five and a quarter or so the thing him? to be careful about with bigger drivers is a bigger driver does not necessarily automatically equate to more output. Okay. You would think so, but that's only if the bigger driver is as good or better. Sure. So, but typically if they're staying in the same brand, maybe the same series, typically it should be scale. at least, you would think so. I'm okay. I'm simply saying that don't take that as an sure. always case. Just you could have an eight inch driver with two millimeters of excursion versus <laughs> yeah. a six and a half with five yeah. millimeters of excursion or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, clips typically doesn't have much to, uh, excursion anyway. They're just Tony says just sit really close. 
What's that? <laughs> Tony says just sit really yeah, close. Yeah, exactly. Like sit on the driver. So maybe, maybe not, buddy. All right. Last question of the night. Danny R says, what processor? And we Ooh. oh, okay. So this one's even harder. Processor not processors in a thousand dollars. All right. Let's I assume think... let's assume AVR. You can still do processor with 3800. That turns into a processor. Pre pro. Yeah. Pre -out yeah. Mode. So I don't know. RZ50 from Onkyo. That's a that's a that's a popular yeah. one with Dirac. The baby the baby Dirac. Do, um, USD. Oh, that will not work. That's eighteen hundred dollars. I thought the IOTA would do that. That's a kind of a new brand, but apparently that's like eighteen hundred dollars. So that is not going to work. I'd be doing Denon thirty eight hundred. Denon thirty eight hundred. Denon thirty eight hundred. But so RZ, it's, it's RZ50. RZ50. Um, the one, the Onkyo. Hmm. If you prefer Dirac. Okay. And so that would be. Um. Does that have pre outs? All channels. Yeah. No, I don't think the RZ50 does. No, oh, I, mean, I, think I thought we were talking about the Denon. The Denon. The Denon sure yeah. does. Yeah. yeah. So then the Denon, technically, I see what you're saying. So that could be run as a processor. I did that for many years. I used it with external amplifiers. So yeah, not only that, Michael, it has a pre-out mode which disengages the internal yeah. amps okay. and boosts the signal to the XLR or to the RCA in this case out. So I think it's something okay. like four volts if I remember really? right from that series. Okay. It, it, it does good it. voltage when nice. it goes into pre-amp mode. I didn't know that. Okay. RZ50 does have pre-outs according to Will. Not, not for everything. Not for everything no. though, because Sheldon's been talking about that saying uh -oh. it's Let's look it up. RZ50 pre out. On Q RZ50. I'm going to look at the rear because I like looking at rears. <laughs> Sorry. It's the lack of sleep. All right. So we are talking about we got pre outs for fronts, center, surrounds, heights, surround backs. Yes, indeed. You do have pre outs for all channels. Does it have is that enough three outs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Where's your eleven? Well, here's a pre out right here. Your height too. And Sheldon's still on here. Yeah. Shish There's Carpenter. Enough. Are you still on here? Yeah. I'm pretty sure he was telling me that it doesn't have the pre outs he needs on the RZ50. But so we got just left right. and right. That's two. Center channels three, four, five for your surrounds. Surround back five, six, height one, seven, eight, and then nine, ten for your um, height two right here. How do we end in ten? Well, magic. Does one subwoofer? No, yeah, that, yeah, no, no, because you should have 11 channels of processing one, beyond two, the sub. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're skipping your nine, center. Seven. I must have said something. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh, eleven. So go. there's eleven. So I just All didn't right. count. I stand corrected. So the Good RZ5 the indeed do have processor or pre outs for eleven channels. Yeah. Billy um Billy P says, I have the RZ50, and yes, it has all pre-outs. Oh, Stitch said he thinks Carp wanted wides. So it does, you, you notice here it's got pre-outs for, there's like a zone two, but maybe internally in the Onkyo, you can't use that as, like you can't add that together. Like you can't use front, center, surround, height one, height two, surround backs and wides it might be a either or does that make sense because again this is a this is 11 channel so technically it's a 9.2 channel avr so that's internal power but it's 11.2 processing more than likely and so you can't do front wides with all of those other speakers because then you're looking at 13 channels and it just can't support that that would be my, yeah, it's 11 instead of 13, correct. So maybe you think that was what he was wanting to do? 
I don't know. I must maybe misremember it. He's not commenting on yeah, the text. Sheldon, yeah. what were you thinking, man? What are you telling me, man? Right. Don't be misleading us. So, <laughs> good to look it up. So this sounds familiar. Did I mess this up once in the past too? This, I feel like I feel nothing. like I got corrected on this RZ50 once before. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not talk about it anymore. No recommendations. Get, so right, get, that, get that in line. Cool, man. Well, we had an awesome show tonight, man. Two hours, 40 minutes, 250 people continuous through the literally the whole stream. It's been great. Um, you guys have asked some great questions, had some good interaction, had a great discussion at the beginning. So hopefully you found value in this. Um, again, we are on Spotify as well as Apple. Thanks to Ryan. So appreciate him setting that up. And so we've got two episodes or we'll have two episodes on there. We've got the original one from last week. And then this one will be the second week. Ryan, I think you said that kind of the way it works is that um, the following day pretty much will be the I'm gonna try. audio version. Maybe I'm still getting used to how long they take to process. So I'm mm -hmm. going to try. It okay. may be Tuesday. Okay. So a day or two after the podcast on YouTube. Yeah, you once I figure it out, it should be pretty consistent. Um, before we jump off here, I want to get back into suggesting a movie. Oh, like we know you're not going to watch it, yeah. so you're hey, not. But I sound it. excited though. I mean, yeah. I just I want to sound like I'm engaged, but I'm like, dude, I ain't watching that. All right, I'm Jonathan, watching. you got anything you want to watch? Nothing, nothing on the tip of my tongue. <sighs> Honestly, you know what I want to watch. And I've already seen it, so I want to see it again. What? Zero Dark Thirty. I don't know if I've even seen that. It's about the. Is that? Are, are they fighting on a roof through a good portion of that movie? Yeah, I have it's, seen it. Then it's where they uh, went after Bin Laden. Let's see. What do I, I want? What do we want to watch? Thirteenth Warrior, Dark Cities. I love Thirteenth Warrior. That I've said that in a previous podcast. One of my favorites. What about? The original Tron against Tron Legacy. I've never seen the original Tron. And do a compare comparative. So now you got to watch two movies? Yeah, but... <laughs> I'm, I, unless Jonathan can come up with something. He said fighting on the roof was 13 hours. I, I, the original Tron sounds fun. I don't know if I'll watch both, but I'll watch the original Tron. I love Tron Legacy. That's not that. That's a favorite. Yeah, I like top. Tron Legacy too. I haven't seen Tron the original Tron in a long time. Is it cheesy? Is it full of cheese? The Wait, Tron, Tron Legacy was re redone in HDR? Yeah. What? It was? That'd be pretty cool. When? On a Tron OLED or something. Movie, Tron 2 better for graphics. When did, when did that happen? <laughs> Look at all these comments. They're saying the original Tron's great. They said Tron is maze balls, man. Somewhat 80s cheesy. 13 hours was this? 80s cheesy is okay. Uh, Tron one isn't cheesy. Oh, oh man. Oh, so there's supposedly a Tron Legacy in 4K HDR mm -hmm. and IMAX open mat. Somewhere I might have to go down a rabbit hole. Open mm -hmm. mat. I should know what that is. Maybe what is that? What I think it's just the mastering for the movie. Mm. I'm gonna have to look, see what I can find. It was a fan thing, but some of those fan things, Ryan, can be really good. So I gotta see if I can find it. That'd be super cool. We'll find out. I guess we'll do Tron. I'm going to watch both. Jonathan, if you would like to watch both, great. Michael, we know you're watch not going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch a home theater tour that I'm editing. I'm going to watch a, uh, I've got some Edifier headphones that I've got in for review that I've already written my review on that. So I'll be watching that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I'll be watching this week. Michael sounds like he's just going to be watching himself. <laughs> sadly it's true that is I, true and i'll i'll pick up tron that'll be fun didn't i wasn't that one of the movies you got from me oh the original no. tron the, the original, original tron yeah um you maybe no but i can just buy it I, i'll just rent it on amazon or something if i need to i don't have it 
Okay. I get to a lot watch of love, a lot of love for Ultron movies in the comments here. A lot I get of love. to watch yeah. another movie on my computer. We're digging it. Yay. <laughs> Stitch said he thinks it's on Disney Plus. Oh, well, that makes it real simple. It makes it easy. Ryan, if you're going to call me a narcissist, at least learn how to spell my name. <laughs> wow. Burn. Bam. That was a good one. Just kidding, brother. But, you know, it's interesting. I have seen more people write McKeel for the spelling of my name. And I have yet in 48 years of living on this planet Earth, I've yet to meet one person that spells their name McKeel ever. But yet a lot of people think that's the spelling of it. It's They're just afraid you're going to hurt them. I don't know. They don't McKeel. tell you. No, it's McKeel. But that's Michael. A-E-L. Excuses, Ryan. <laughs> He's one hand typing while bleeding out of the other hand. I hope you didn't hurt yourself, man. Okay. He's got that cool home theater he's building, man. He's probably cutting cutting some wood or something. Hope you didn't lose a finger, man. Cool. All right, guys. I hope you all have a great week. Again, we'll have this podcast up in the next day or two on Spotify. And um, Oh, he drilled his finger. That's not smart, what? brother. Oh, no. That's smart. And we need to take your power tools away from you. Sounds like fat yeah, layer. We distracted him with this podcast while he's doing a power drill. Oh, that was yeah, smart. How we doing that, dude? So, all right, fellas. Always great. We had a blast. Appreciate y'all in the chat. Appreciate all those super chats. Appreciate the engagement. So hit the like button on your way out, and we'll catch you next week. Take care, guys. Night, folks.